Um, I know that our chair is going to be joining us shortly, uh, but she asked that we get rolling, you know, not hold anybody up. She was mm -hmm. going to be late for sure, so um, we'll just, uh, we really have nothing to do but to listen and enjoy all of you this evening. <laughs> uh, so we're going to sit back and let that happen. It's my favorite thing. Uh, so on we go. Wow. <laughs> Thanks, John. I yeah, I'm calling it order. That's it. Um, I do have one thing um, under the town manager's report. There's been a couple sections of town that have reported uh, inconsistency in U.S. mail delivery. So I did reach out to Congressman Moulton uh, yesterday and got a couple of answers. I'll give out two phone numbers tonight. I may have another update tomorrow, and the board is meeting tomorrow night. Uh, community can call either the Woburn Postmaster at 781-937-8600. Again, that's the Woburn Postmaster. That's where the Reading Mail comes from at 781-937-8600. Or they can call the U.S. Post Office directly at uh, 1-800-275-8777. Again, that's 1-800-275-8777. Um, Congressman Moulton's office has been very responsive. We may have more of an update tomorrow, and we're going to be able to give out a phone number in his office tomorrow if there's not anything resolved. So I just wanted the community to understand this is an important time of year. Obviously, people are waiting for packages and things. I know a couple of years ago, one of my daughters was waiting for a passport in order to travel abroad for a semester. So this is a time of year people are, have a careful eye on their mail. And uh, at least we want to get answers for the residents who, in some cases, cases have only been getting mail one or two days a week for a couple of weeks so that's all I have John okay well I think that um, our agenda as I said is is tied directly to the presentations yep. and I think yes. Amy's first all right this is louder than I thought it was <laughs> so um, thank you very much to the select board and to all of you gosh we, we lost a lot of people public safety and Administrative services, nobody wants to see us tonight. Um, but the show is much more fun. Um, <laughs> um, we're, the, we're the cool crowd. Um, so, thank you again. It's always a pleasure to present our budget to the select board uh, for it goes to the FinCon. Um, as usual, our annual budget request is based on what the Board of Trustees and I feel that it needs to take to fulfill our mission vision, core values, and our strategic plan, as well as to meet the legislative uh, regulatory mandates governed through the state. I do include our mission, which is to provide professional services, trusted resources, cultural and educational programs, as well as a welcoming community space where everyone is welcome to grow, collaborate, and participate in respectful discourse, especially that last one. Um, if you're really interested in research, then uh, you're welcome to look at the Mass General Laws and the Code of Mass Regulations, but we are, um, in order to, make cert to remain certified, there are a bunch of things that we need to do, which includes the money that we get from the town, it has to increase by a certain percentage share, we have a minimum number of open hours, as well as a materials budget allocation. Um, I always like to remind folks that it is essential that we remain certified um, and in good standing with the Massachusetts Board of Library Commissioners. This allows the state to uh, allows us to receive direct state aid. We actually um, got our certification and our first state aid payment last week, which is great. Um, and it also allows us, uh, makes us eligible for some state and federal grants. And it also allows all of you, all the residents, to use any library in the Commonwealth um, free of charge. A Amy, yes. Could you could you do the wrapper thing with the microphone so we can hear? No, you no, can't no, hear. Might so, not so we can hear you. So I go, you're not I'm hearing. I'm having it. right. So just uh, like cup it. And I can do that. Yeah, that's awesome. Like, I don't like microphones. Mic drop. So, um, so all that stuff I just said about Andy Friedman. <laughs> well played. Um, okay. So thank you. Um, just a quick review of our organizational chart. Um, thanks to the reorganization approved uh, last a year ago by the trustees and implemented, approved and funded through town meeting, our reorganization is complete. Um, we reduced our divisions from five divisions to three divisions, um, including an administrative division, that would be my division, where we work on the daily operations, the budgeting, long-range planning, uh, 
uh, meeting room management, communications, as well as staff development. There's also now a collection services department. That's what you normally think of as the back of the house. Uh, they're responsible for all of our materials, all of our stuff. So that includes our physical materials as well as anything in our digital or virtual collection that is um, downloaded or streamed. Um, they make sure that you all have access to that. Access includes purchasing, processing, um, what we call circulation control, making sure that things that go out come back in, uh, and account management, there's a lot of technical stuff involved with that. And then we have the public services division, um, which according to its name, is all of our public programming and public services. And that ranges from, you know, classes and lectures and meetups to readers advisory, reference and research, one-to-one -one technical assistance. So anything, any of those services you're getting out on the floor of the library or by calling or emailing or texting us. So those are the three divisions. I also just want to point out that um, I do include, this was from our, this is our fiscal year 20 FTE count. It's from June to September, it's 22.7. It bumps up a little because from October to May, we're also open on Sundays. But um, in fiscal year 19, we had almost 2,000 hours of volunteer time. That's almost the equivalent of one full-time employee. So um, we could not do what we do without volunteers, the teen and adult volunteers that we have in the library on a daily basis. Any questions about our organization? Amy, I have yes. a question. So um, thanks for the FTEs, first of all. That's great, and the volunteers. Are there um, part-time employees, as in very part-time? Mm -hmm. And you round them into FTEs? Yes. Okay. So it's the average number of hours of service. So it's not necessarily per employee. It's the number of hours that we have. Um, so we have, we have regularly scheduled folks. And then we have per diem folks that fill in. So if a regularly scheduled person is sick or takes a vacation day, they're filled in by per diems. Okay, so our budget request is for 3%. Um, the budget was framed looking at employee retention and succession planning, um, which sort of seem opposite of each other, but we want to keep as many people as we can, but we also want to plan for retirements. Um, we also want to continue and increase our uh, in increase and improve our communications. I don't think we're the only department, um, town department, that is consistently getting, you know, how can you talk to us better? How can we learn about you? What are the different ways that we can find out about what's going on at the library? Um, it is, particularly today, something that we have to spend um, time and thought uh, working on. And there's no single answer. It's a multi-pronged approach in every instance. So it's not something that's going to go away. And we also, every year, work to expand our outreach efforts and to connect with under and unserved residents in the community. So that's, that's how the general breakdown is. It's 3% both in salaries and in expenses. So while the increase in salaries is 3%, uh, we've jiggered things around a little bit. I mean, notice there's a little drop in administration and collection services and the increase in public services. This is reflective of where we're continuing to see increases and expansion in our use of the library, so more programs. There's a there's request for more programs, more story times, more team programming, more programming for older adults, um, more public services, more training, more instruction. Um, so we jittered things around so that it equals 3%, and I was able to squeeze out another about 10 hours of time, which is a net increase for fiscal year 21 of 0.3 FTP, that's 0.3, not 3, just to be clear. Um, so that's just sort of working with the numbers that we have. Um, the increase across the board, well, I mean, you can look at the expenses, it was meant to net out at 3, um, increased our library programming budget, uh, just smaller growth in some of our contracts, um, no increase in our technology, World start next to that. Um, just a reminder, this is the second year that the state allows us to purchase public technology, so things like direct computers, mice, monitors, software that the public uses. We can apply that to our materials, our, our book techs, um, our materials budget expense. So um, we haven't had to increase that t technology line. And just also um, in terms of I know we're always concerned about streamlining purchasing and everything. Um, the town IT budget, which falls under that, um, that that is that supports our staff 
um, upgrade, so that's not included. All of our staff computers, things like that, the printers, a lot of that is all funded through Town IT, and it's one way we've been able to keep the library budget low by you know making sure that we're doing group purchasing and things along with Town Hall. So, I think there's anything else on that. I'm really hoping this is the most long presentation you'll hear tonight. <laughs> no, no, sorry. No surprises. So the very last, um, I'd just like to throw this in there. I've done it for three years in a row. Um, this is your return on investment. Um, fiscal year 19, the town invests one point, almost $1.7 million. Um, using the value calculator, you got back um, we, we got back $7.7 .7 million for a net uh, return on investment of $5.9 million, or 351%. So that's not a bad investment of your tax dollars. Um, I actually, um, I look at these every year just to sort of get a sense because they cost about the increase or decrease in our services. But I was noticing that if we just look at the children's books borrowed, so that's children's from birth until grade five, maybe grade six, it's 2.3, it's a value of 2.3 million dollars. <coughs> that is more than the budget for the year was. So those are books and DVDs and materials that were circulated to pre-readers and their families. Free reading for students K through six, uh, student support, uh, books and materials that went out to teachers, supported the school curriculum, and things like that. So. Just the children of Reading alone are getting a full benefit of, of the library budget. So I think it's well worth a 3% increase. Can I ask you what the, what's the calculating scheme that lets you get to a rate of Sure, the average, the average value is on the right hand column. So it is rough. Um, so the average adult book is, is, is a massage number. So it would cost price. $17 to buy the book. Right, it might cost 25 for a hardcover or 15 for a paper book, so they average it out. And so then you, the assumption then is that if everybody was buying that book Correct. that borrowed it, it would cost $1.8 million. Correct. So, Correct. I mean. Actually, you know, the children's books borrowed are just books. I was wrong. That's not DVDs. That's not children's DVDs and children's music and children's playways and things like that. That's just children's picture books. Uh, the summer, you know, the required, the MCBA required, required reading for grade four and five. Um, that's all just books that go out. Well, I, you know, I just, I guess there's no, I mean, I understand the enormous value mm -hmm. that inures to the, you know, to the citizens of the town. And I guess this is just the only way you can plug it into something. Yeah. You know, I mean, right. other than just going, wow, it's cool, we like to go apply for it. Right. Right. So, right. You're trying to tie it to an economic value. Yeah. Um, which, I don't think it's misleading, but I think it's hard to calculate. Oh, it's absolutely hard to calculate because it's you know I mean if you can you could every you know if everybody could subscribe to Disney Plus and Netflix and Amazon and Sling and ESPN and we added all those things together, I'm sure people would be you know if they were putting the cord. Um, but we do. They would people. run away screaming. They, they would run away screaming. Yeah. yeah. So I mean, it's 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 the most basic number that you can come up with. Um, some of them are probably skewed a little bit, like research on data, research databases. Um, that's a really hard one to say because um, you know no high school student is going to go and do a JSTOR um, research article where you're paying 30, 40 bucks an article, which I had to do. Um, not 20 bucks an article or 20 bucks a search necessarily, but it's something that's hard to do, um, to quantify. Uh, museum passes borrowed, you know, the aquarium's like 50, 60 bucks a pop, whereas something else might only be uh, five or 10 dollars, you know? Well, actually that one looks like it's, I mean, that's one that's pretty definable. But well, it depends on the museum. So we have everything from the spot pond passes to UMass Lowell uh, yeah. basketball and hockey to uh, Miramac Repertory Theater, um, Museum of Science, Museum of Fine Arts, as well as the Garden Museum. It's just an interesting way to mm -hmm. interpolate the return. Right. Um, and I, I, I don't know, I can't think of another way to do it, but it really speaks a lot about the value proposition. Right. Again, even if you just bought all of your books online at $5 a pop, you'd still be making money. Yeah. 
Yep. So. Can you talk a little bit about how we're trending with different kinds of transactions? In trending in our own use, trending because we're unique and wonderful and fabulous, or trending against other communities in Massachusetts? Um, I was thinking against ourselves first, but um, feel free to talk about how fabulous we are. Yeah. <laughs> No, um, I think in trending, we're seeing a leveling off of services that we saw a punch in in 2016 when we moved into the new building. No question. That's just, that was a huge jump. That was an unsustainable jump. Um, having said that, it's expanding. It expands just like other services do as the town grows. So um, if you've got, you know, um, a 3% growth of 780 people coming into the community, that's not very many people. Um, but 3% of 26,000 is roughly something like that, I think. So 780 people is 780 new, you know, potential clients that we provide services to. We don't get rid of 780, it's not a swap. So the services grow. Um, we do things like, you know, things where we used to have a single story time, we now have back-to-back -back story times because there's twice as many uh, families that want to come to that. Um, which just means that our staff are on the floor, preparing the story time, story time, doing the story time, having to manage the desk while they're off of the story time, so. Yeah. Um, um, are you seeing kind of net transactions growing uh, at um, that sort of rate or higher? No, I mean, I wouldn't anticipate, I, yeah, I, I would expect a consistent, I would, I would expect, well, what I expect or what other people expect. But I, I, writing traditionally has always, always been higher per capita in circulation of sheer books, period. It's very, it's very interesting. And actually the audio books as well. So years ago communities were like, dump all your books on CD, dump all your um, playaways. Nobody's gonna be listening to them anymore. We see an increase. We see an increase in our um, overdrive downloadable books uh, for, for, uh, for audio. Uh, Reading, Reading users buck the trend. They like to read books. Reading is reading. Reading is reading, and we are one reading. Um, so, so in terms of that, it's not going to be. It's certainly not going to be more than one to two percent growth each year. Um, and in fact, I would expect to see some of that level off as some of the digital services. So we are slowly increasing um, as we increase our streaming services. We have Hoopla, we have Canopy. Those have TV shows, music, movies. Um, Canopy has actually a lot more independent movies and documentaries on it. Um, those right now are limited by use. You can use up to three things per whatever. Um, but as that audience grows, we might decrease some of our physical DVD collection or our physical music collection. How do visits look? They're steady, quarter of a million, two hundred thirty thousand, I think. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, it's busy. Um, one other question on that, in terms of uh, room usage. Yep. How how utilized are we? It's good. We have a little over um, probably sixty. I think it, one of the the community rooms difficult because we book it as two rooms. So it, you know it's hard to. Is it one room, two room, A, B, A together? Um, it's definitely over 60% in use. Uh, sometimes that use is, I'll explain this, but if we have to set up like the music stage for something, for an evening program, we may book the whole room for the whole day. So because we simply can't set it up and set it down, set it up and set it down. So sometimes that it's a little inflated, but there are, um, we're averaging about 300 community uses per year. Um, we only charge ten. If you're if you're not a nonprofit, you, you do do twenty. Um, that money doesn't come to us; it goes to the town general fund. And in fiscal year 19, I think it was 2,600, 2,610 um, that came in in revenue for that. It's not that much, but it's it's a little, and hopefully it goes back into making sure facilities can cover the the one. The, I will say this: one thing about the meeting rooms is facilities. The John Davis and Linda and Jorge. They do an amazing job. We could not, they are not library employees, they are facilities employees. And, um, you know, we're still trying to figure out how we can build for their time because these folks are here early in the morning setting up all of these chairs, not for us, but for a community group that's paid $10. And um, I, if you ask me, not my nice staff, but if you ask me, $10 gets you four walls and some air. That's what that's what that's what your room rental is for ten bucks. I wouldn't even give them chairs on the table, but those my staff provide chairs on a table. But there is, you know, we we struggle with uh, 
sending staff down for technical support, to get the, to get the microphone working, to get the screen working. Um, every time we do that, that's a half an hour away from you know, something that this person was assigned to. Um, we, ch we spend a lot of time, we have great software, but it's not perfect. Um, so we you know, spend, I try to put it in perspective of we don't want to spend three hours chasing down $10 because I pay people more than $10. Um, but we do want to get that money. Um, so it's, it's it's not a free service. It's something we kind of, we take a fee of $10 and we do the best we can with that. It certainly doesn't cover expenses. No. <laughs> no. Um, even though we would be entitled to do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm curious about, uh, if you go back to the slide before this one. So you got flat 3% in salaries and expenses mm -hmm. and you know i mean I, I sort of see how you get to the salary thing pretty easy mm -hmm. um how do you get there do you do you come up with a number and then back it off um i mean i'm just that's interested a, yeah in your no uh, it's magic <laughs> I it's 100 percent magic um it's the magic of itself <laughs> no um I start by looking at where we are. So who, who's using what? So for example, this year um, I budgeted some overtime because we were we were with the reorganization. That was something that we, we were really curious about. Um, nobody's using that. So I took that out of administration and put all that money into to public services because um, I'm now need to keep I'm now running over in public services and under in administration. So I'm simply well, I'm kind of just redistributing the same amount. And I get that. It's you know it's it's a way to retain people that mm -hmm. are hard to retain, maybe. Yeah, but it's also it's not about that particular part, it's not about retention, that's about just simply needing a body. Yeah. So it's about another person. It's not yeah, it's I mean it's the same it's it's not a new hire by any stretch of the imagination, but it's moving someone from twenty hours to twenty three hours. So I guess what I'm really asking you and then I'll you know stop torturing you because no, you fine. know, I mean what we're spending for what we're getting is is a great value proposition. That's very important. But so we operate at two and a half percent, and then we put three percent in here. Mm -hmm. um, and so at a certain, and, you know, and, and when you look at the the actual cash differential, it's not large. No. Um, I mean, it really isn't, and I get that. So I was asking you about how you get to what you yeah. did because. You know, if you started with two and a half and said that's not enough, and then you take that's it kind of where we start. Is that what you do? I guess yeah. that's what I'm asking. Yeah, that is, and I mean, and part of it is we start with the cola. We start with a step in the cola, and I see where we end up with yeah. that. But then I look at okay, admins running a little under. Uh, uh, yeah, admins running under, but already this year public services is running over. There's a gap there. Why is that happening? And you talk to your staff. You talk to your division head. Well, we have to keep calling this person in because we need backup coverage because we have now three programs running at three o'clock in the afternoon. Um, you know, we, we're impacted by the high school change, actually, believe it or not. So things that we used to start at 2.30, <laughs> yeah. they all start at 3.30 now. Well, and everybody's at 3.30. So now we've got, you know, three, four staff members running things. We, we, still, have three, we still have four public service desks. So, you know, we're, we're doing a lot of shuffling and, and that kind of thing. Um, we have a tremendous number of teenagers um, in this space. So there is a minimum no amount of staffing that we need. And that's a bare minimum number of staff. Yeah. And that would be for, I'll just say, it would be, I just want to say there's a big difference between minimum staffing and optimal staffing when you have a full building. We're not over capacity, but you will go in that building and you don't necessarily want the minimum capacity when that building is well, as far as it the, is. You're not going to get the maximum output if you use the minimum. Well, no, you can't, you can't help people. So, and, and don't misinterpret the question. It's not, it's not a pushback yeah, anyway. I'm just okay. kind of. Yeah. Curious so as how we get we, we start three percent was such a round number. Yeah, three percent uh, was a step in a cola. Yeah, a step in a one percent cola, and then you look at where that hits, and then you look at you know I don't necessarily have to increase overtime by three right. three percent, so we're a step in a cola. So now you just you just plug the numbers back and in. And then we consolidate the other expenses, the yeah. the health insurance and all that kind of stuff. Yes, and so that's off. yes, um, and that's a big help. It, it is a big. Yeah. It's a you know. It, so the number you get there doesn't include that for sure. No, and it doesn't include you know. So this is the this is a budget that I present to the trustees before this, and I'll go back to the trustees after right. this. And um, many times, this budget that's been presented here 
which may have been 3%, was cut. Was cut yeah. to not even 2.5%, was cut to 1.9%. Um, this is what we feel. This is what we feel this we need to run need to the it. library. Right. Yeah. Right. Not No more. No more than that. Because I could ask. <laughs> no, I challenge any department had to say they couldn't ask for more. Well, we did this exercise a few years ago yeah. in a very I different dare. way. Dare you. Because we wanted to know what yeah. we really need. Yeah, what, what's the bare bones? Yeah. 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 No, I, you know, I don't want to beat to death. I just was no. real curious about what the process No, I, I respect that, and I understand you guys have been through, you've heard enough, you heard Judy the other day, and you've heard all the other departments talking about it is a fine balance between we're not going to give anybody any raises for two years in a row because we're just really trying to cut costs and goodbye staff. You know, like you have to balance that out. So it's 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 not something that I. It's they're not, certainly not numbers that I come. It is magic, but I don't come up with it in a vacuum. I work with the trustees, and I you know I work. We talked as department heads. We talk about this. Bob gives us a tremendous amount of guidance from FinCom and Sharon, and they all go to those meetings, which I don't have to go to, which I'm thankful for. So, was that better, Andy? Well, no, Anne has a question. Oh, this kind of going back to the fees question, the fees mm -hmm. for the community room. Yep. Since those fees are not covering costs, is would are you the person who sets the fees? The board of trustees says board that, and and it's something that um, again, like we don't make money on the printing fees per se, um, right. because the cost. I mean, it pays for some of the toner and some of the printing and replacing the printer. It pays for some of that. Actually, it might pay for even almost all of it, but we consider it to be a service to the community. So we try to keep the costs as low as possible, um, and it's sort of, you know, the the community room is used primarily by the library. So we right. absorb the cost of sure, that. Sure, sure. So, um, you know, John, Linda, and Murray do a tremendous amount of work for us. Um, more than more than sixty hours. So. If I might, uh, several years back before the library was renovated, we had a brief discussion at the board about um, bringing the three elected boards together and discussing whether or not to have some sort of uniform uh, policy. And generally speaking, the three around elected boards fees. were not interested. <laughs> um, <laughs> Sorry, it's uniform policy around fees. Fees, yes. So what happens now is people shop. Schools are the most expensive, the town is next, and the library is the cheapest. So guess what? Some people will try to go to the library first. Now, I don't really have an opinion on that, other than that's just what's happened. If the three elected boards wanted to be uniform, that opportunity could be there. I don't know if there's an advantage or a disadvantage, but um, you know, it's always a discussion that could be had. It really is a philosophical discussion. I mean, it's really, the schools tend to have a lot more revolving funds. They tend to retain a lot of the money that they bring in. Uh, the town and the library do not, so they tend to bring money to the general fund. I don't know if that's an influence, mm -hmm. but that, that is a discussion, a policy level discussion that you certainly could have with your other elected boards. It's the same um, with the revolving funds. You can't charge more than the cost of providing. Is that also for, true? Theoretically, that. Is that also that? true for? Mm -hmm. um, fees. fees that are trying to go to the general fund. Mm -hmm. that, that's correct, but it's the actual nuts and bolts is pretty complex. You know, is health insurance part of the fee? So on and so forth. Right. It's complicated. Sure. But yes. Is it? Yes. Yeah. It is part of the fee. Um, not for town and school and library. But it is for schools. Schools, yes. For schools, it is. Yeah. Oh, it um, is. So the, and another example would be when we go to upgrade, we're looking at some video conferencing technology. But that's something we feel is important to the library service, and that's something that we look to for uh, grants and gifts and donations. It doesn't or um, I suppose it could be a capital request, but that's not something that we look to the town necessarily to supply because we're not. It's a nice service to have for people who use the room, but it's something that we need to do in order to fulfill our mission. So um, the community can benefit from that um, planning and that that those purchases. Um, but it's not it's not something that we would necessarily charge for. And honestly, the equipment is you know there's equipment and electricity and there's heat and um, that that is all a little complex. Yeah. But the hardest, the biggest stress is the, the time and toll that it takes on the people hours to get that stuff done. And that's um, it's not particularly difficult. It's just it's just day in and day out and distraction and pulling away from what you're doing and. Um, 
that's fine. It's it's just a fact. Cost yes, the cost of doing business. Really, this was supposed to be the shortest presentation. Go ahead. Go ahead. So two things. One is at some point there's got to be a crossover where you're you're kind of losing on your core services because you're spending so much time supporting these other things. And and further, um, the rates have an impact across different departments of the mm -hmm. town, but also against private locations mm -hmm. in the town. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, although it may be admirable and good to offer the services at very low cost, um, when it doesn't, if we can't cover costs and it requires a budget increase at some point, that's a crossover point in my view. That's right, but do you mean, do you mean against like, like church rental or do against you mean church against rental, schools? any other private space in town, yeah. but, but also the fact that you've got different rates even school yeah. versus other, yeah. other locations. Um, you know, it's still a trustee decision. Um, I definitely will throw the trustees right up there. Um, it's a, definitely a trustee decision. Um, I think that the the, the people cost is, um, I wish it includes providing a space to collaborate and, con and conduct a discourse. It's a place to, you know, that we do feel that is a core part of our mission, not an extra, extra added service. Um, as much as I just said that. Um, it, it is something that is, cool. you know, providing a place where the community can meet face-to-face -to, -face to, to eliminate, reduce isolation, um, uh, disconnect. That is that is essential to what we do. That is why we build that building. Um, doing it in a meeting space, great. Um, can also happen other places. There, there is a concern, and we are aware about the discrepancies. It's not a huge amount between the I think it's almost the same for the Pleasant Street Center and the library. Schools are a little bit more because they just they do include the custodians. And they include custodians, and it's more by hour. Like it's a, it's a chunk, like maybe an hour or two hours, and we do three or four hours. But um, oh shoot, I just lost my train of thought. <laughs> but it was a really awesome point. Um, <laughs> Wait, so you're you think it's a it's well, part of it's all part, part of our service, right? right? It's all part of our service. So I, I certainly, we, I certainly, oh, we we look at the meeting room policy, and people are saying um, we we actually just changed our policy to say you can meet there more than six times per year. We were very specific and said this is not a home based clubhouse for anybody. You have your Boy Scout troop or your you know your Cub Scouts, and you meet here and here. But you want to have that special event at the library? You can do that a couple, three times, six times a year. What you can't do is meet here every year because it's the cheapest place in town. So we do, we are, you know, we recommend the churches, the Big North has a place and REI has a space and so we do recommend a lot of these places. A lot of the businesses actually will do it for free um, or at least as, as you know, for low cost. So, um, but yeah, most of the churches have space that you can rent as well. So we, we are very cognizant of that. I'm just going to leave that on. Karaoke. Yeah, it's karaoke, right? Okay, everybody can hear me with the mic? My name is Matt Pinellas. I'm the Administrative Services Director for the Town of Reading. And before you is the FY21 budget presentation for Administrative Services. Here we have um, an org chart, which is an overview of the entire um, department. And we have it divided into five divisions. There is the <coughs> Office of the Town Clerk, Human Resources, Town Manager's Office, Operations, and Technology. In the blue boxes, we have all the staff positions. And in the other boxes, we have all the boards that fall under administrative services, which there are quite a bit. So does anybody have any questions on the way we have it structured? Hey, Matt? It's pretty much the same as last year. Yep. Are you the Administrative Services Director? I am. Okay, <laughs> just making sure. Thank okay, you. did I not introduce myself as that? <laughs> I'm I, sorry. sorry, I wasn't on track at that point. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. 
Yes, I'm the Administrative <laughs> Services Director. I've been here about five years. And the Ombudsman. And I also serve as the Town Ombudsman, which is a person that handles a lot of the relationships between the town residents and the town staff. So I thought I'd just give you a little bit of an overview of the department and then probably go into some of the specifics of the, uh, the budget as it pertains to the divisions. So administrative services supports all town departments here in boards with communication services, technology, HR, procurement, document management, insurance, and legal services. And currently we have 17.5 FTEs in the department which is just about the same as prior years. As I walk through the different divisions, I'll, I'll highlight any changes, if we have changes. Um, many of the divisions are level services budgets, um, so I won't spend too much time at that. But the main driver of increases really comes out of the election budget, and I'll get to that, but we have more elections this year, and that's what it's about. So. The town manager's office, no real changes there. That includes the select board, finance committee, legal services, and we're asking for a level services budget. The next division is the town clerk's office. This includes elections, voter registration, census, town meeting, licenses, document storage. Here is where the main increase from my department is coming. We have three elections due in 2021. Most notably, the federal uh, presidential general election coming up next November. So there's increases in all of, most if not all of the election line items uh, to pre pre prepare for that. And I know that our town clerk, Laura Jem, had been to the select board at least two or three times to uh, talk about elections in general. And I think she had highlighted that there were some more elections coming up that would affect the 2021 budget. So it's the main driver there. Yes. Sorry, can I drive you back for a sec? Yes. Um, when you say a level services budget, mm -hmm. what does that translate to? In percent. In percent for the whole department or? Well, for looking at town manager's office, for example, it says level right. services budget. Yes. What, what percent is that? Oh, excuse me. So I believe that is, I think it's in your muni sheets, but I think it's definitely um, the muni sheets, but that's why I'm asking. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> I think it's 6.5 if I'm reading it correctly. That's no, law. that's more. No, okay, sorry. Be that um, it's not right here. No, because it's divided up into lots of pieces. Um, I'll let the town manager answer since yeah, it's Mark, last <laughs> week you asked for divisional numbers, so tomorrow I have a handout and that's one of them. Thank you. Um, plus I wanted some feedback tonight on other things. Great. Thank uh, you. Let's see. It's not in this sheet here. Um, The way, the way Matt presents it, it includes four different components. So it looks to be in in the budget proper, we list each four separately. So it ranges from 3% for my salaries to maybe a 6% legal. So it looks like it's somewhere in between if we add them all up. In the summary I have, I've actually split out every single piece and not just aggregated at the town manager's office. Okay, so yeah, I think the legal might have been the highest one because we added it in other 10,000 case we have settlements that we have to fund somehow and never budget for. Sorry, settlements or? Settlements. Okay. And as legal services? Um, we pay small settlements out of the legal budget that, okay. that don't require uh, town meeting approval. I think they're at 25000 It's not often. You can see from the track record, uh, it's happened on a couple of occasions, but it seemed like we should budget for it. Sorry. The other thing that may affect legal services is we'll be negotiating with Verizon. Again, we had done Comcast a couple of years ago, and um, we do need legal additional legal help for that. So the Verizon contract um, is up about a year from now. I think it's January of 2021. So they didn't really want to negotiate with us until about this summer, but we may start a little before then. But that's gonna, that, that will affect this next budget. We need a separate attorney for that. Well, last time we actually used an attorney in town council's office. We, we looked at some 
outside attorneys and the people that were doing it on a regular basis couldn't fit us in. And Ray actually had an attorney in his office at the time that was developing yeah, that right. area. So we did use that. So. Did another question, Ann? Uh, I was wondering um, with regard to the town clerk's responsibility uh, regarding the census. Obviously, 2020 is the year. Yes. Um, is, the, are, is there a dedicated part of the budget going towards census outreach? The, the, the census is in the budget, and I know Laura has some plans for outreach. I don't know if she had spoke to you about that when she came to see you the last time. Um, but I know that census outreach is important, and she will be working on that um, as the 2020 census uh, comes up. So, yes. <coughs> so, again, going back to the town clerk's budget, the... Um, the main increase to the driver there is the three elections, including the general election next November, as I said, which would be the presidential election. Operations is the next uh, division. Responsibilities there include procurement, communications, risk management, constituent services. There's also shared staff in that budget and postage and equipment management. Um, that is a level services budget. If I look at it, I think it's just Two, two and a half to three percent as uh, as normal. But under um, operations, I, I bring this chart, I try to bring this slide every year, is communications. And we've done a lot with communications through the years that I've been here. So this is the, what we call the 360 degree uh, chart of municipal communication. And as I go, I'll go through them just quickly so people at home can see. But the first uh, box all the way over to the to the left at the top is code red, which is our reverse 911 system. C click fix, which is an app that allows people to communicate directly with town staff, social media, and the website. And some of the ways that we do things that we've done things for years, face to face, obviously, telephone, uh, mail, RCTV. Surveys, we usually use SurveyMonkey, um, credit card and online payments, and newspapers. But going back to the newer ways that we communicate, so code red, if people can see it, we're, we're up to over 15,000 contacts for Reading for the reverse 911. C-Click Fix, we're over 700 users on C-Click Fix now. Social media, when I told the story before, but when I first started here, there was no social media in Reading, we didn't have a Facebook page, we didn't have Twitter. That's something we started um, after I came here. Now we have almost 3,000 followers on Facebook. We have a Twitter page. And our top post on Facebook this year uh, got almost 10,000 views. And I believe that was regarding the, um, the water issue we had mm -hmm. last month. Um, and we had revamped the, the website also since I've been here. So as we look to ways to communicate, we always want to improve things. But there are several different ways we communicate. Um, we have a, a person besides myself, Jane Miller, who you'll hear on the Code Red calls and does a lot of the Facebook for us. So we've really dedicated ourselves to improve communications and we've done it through administrative services. Hey Matt, before you move on, yes. a couple questions on here. Yes. Um, the 15,300 Code Reds, what percent of the community is attached this way? What percent of the community is attached? Yeah, in other words, if you, if you had, how many households do we have in town? 17, 18,000? No, no, about 19, no, 20, 7, 8,000. 8, 8, okay, yeah. so this is multiple contacts yeah. per person, so like cell phone, home phone. Right. Um, is that in people in the house, multiple people? Got it. Yeah. Is it email as well as text um, as well as Yeah, there's several everything? different ways you can sign up. I've signed up for everything just so I see it. So I'll get a call. On my cell phone, I'll get a call at home, I'll get a text message, I'll get an email, just so I, I make sure that it's working correctly. But um, it, it's hard to miss somebody once they sign up for this. So, yeah. Is there a way to kind of benchmark getting to as many people as possible? And, and, um, yeah, I, I can um, pull some numbers from the system and talk to Jane, and I know we, we constantly try to increase it. And I know after the water issue we had, Last month, we had a lot of people contacting us saying, "Hey, how do I sign up for this?" Or, you know, I wasn't, I wasn't included. So, um, they can sign up for it. Um, there's also a separate system through the school department that's used for school cancellations and whatnot that we don't oversee. But, yeah, but we, it's been a good system for us. I think the the other departments here, fire and police especially, would agree. Okay. Um, yep. Just kind of going down the list for a second too. So, um, on the website. Um, you know, you know, I've talked a little bit about this. Is there a way 
even utilizing student resources or others to um, use it in a, in a more forward fashion, more active fashion. Um, sometimes there, if there aren't new posts, there are things that can get aged on there yeah. um, that aren't as current. And, and there, there are people, I know some of them personally, who don't use social media. Right. Yeah. Um, and this is still a great way to, to get out to those folks. And I'm wondering if there's a way to think about and I, and either working with students for a course or, or you know, other ways. That's just an example. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I've, I've heard, and I've, I've heard that before, and one of the issues is, you know, static websites are, are not as dynamic as, as social media nowadays. So we're always trying to, you know, have people go to the website because there's a lot of information there. A lot of times we'll put up the current news, and until we have more news, it kind of stays there, so it looks stale. Um, but we don't want to take it down, too, because it's a matter of public record at that time when we put it up. So it's maybe a matter of generating more news and more topics to put on the website. Um, because I could see people's point there where a story may be a couple weeks old and they've already known about it and it's on the front page. And that's just the way the news is aggregated. So, yeah. But we can look for ways. I'm, I'm open to students, too. I mean, that's the next generation. And I'm sure they'll think of something. Yeah, know. plus they, they would do it really quickly and easily and, and yeah. keep it current. Right. Um, one more question on here too. I know we've also talked about uh, one of the services, any of the services that would allow for an easy way to coordinate and compare town, our town's data, right? Typically budget data more yep. than anything else, mm -hmm. with other communities in a consistent fashion, just to make it easier and more transparent for right. folks to see that. Yeah. I any thoughts on? Uh, Testing them, I appreciate there's a budget consideration. Yeah, and I don't minimize that. Well, we goal. we did. There was one company that um, that I had met at the MMA conference, and I think I spoke to you about them as well. We they came in and did some demonstrations for us, and I passed on the information to the FinCom to see if FinCom the, the FinCom chair was interested in that kind of data. And you know, I know it's going to take a while to go through it, but if they are interested, I'm happy to bring them back and do a further demonstration and you know there's a lot of other companies out there too right. that was one specifically that, that did a lot of talents in our area so so yes is the answer to that thank you so, right. okay the next division we have is human resources this is um, responsible for hiring training testing and it's important to note that they serve all departments including the school department light department and retirees uh, because benefits are centralized under human resources. And I know Judy Perkins came um, just last week to give everybody an update of what's going on in human resources and talk about training and whatnot. Um, so I won't go too much into that. A couple of considerations under the budget impact. We now have a dedicated uh, full-time HR generalist, um, which is great for us. And there's, I said there's no budget impact to that because we were always paying for the full-time generalist. We were sharing him. Now we're not sharing that position any longer. That's 100% under the town. So that's a, that's a plus. And we're also asking for a small increase in the training budget because as you saw from Judy's demonstration last week, we, we are doing a lot of training. We think it's important. So. And the last division that come under us here is technology. That's the centralized com uh, computer and telecommunication services. Network management, audiovisual software, computer support, and the GIS mapping. It's a level service services budget, um, but they are asking for some funding to speed up the equipment replacement cycle, um, just to keep up with the technology and make sure that we have the tools that we need to, to do technology. I know Amy had talked about how we serve not just the town but the library with technology services. So, so that's the technology budget. So all in all, there are some increases, and I think it's mostly relegated to elections, maybe some in legal. Um, but for the most part, I think this is a workable budget, and I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Yeah. I have a question, Matt. Sorry. Yep. <laughs> uh, equipment replacement cycle. Do you have a feel for where we are now and what the goal would be? Yeah, I think we're, we're making progress there, and our IT department is always on the lookout for, for good deals for us, for government discounts. Um, so I think that we are, we're getting there, we're not there 100% yet, and we want to make sure that we have the tools we need to get the job done. So um, hopefully after this, this time next year, after this budget, we'll be probably where we need to be 
and just maintain it until the next round comes where we need to upgrade. But it's hard keeping up with a lot of the changes that go on in that sort of field. Do you have a feel for what that number is? Kind of how many years? I can I'd say five. five. Yeah, I can definitely check that technology, time. but yeah. Somewhere Oops. in between. Yeah, yeah. It kind of is. <laughs> Got it. Good. Uh, one of the things that's important to keep uh, in mind with this, um, although the technology staff's looking for deals, uh, the deals are almost always in schools. Schools can buy technology in some cases for 10 and 15 cents on the dollar. If we get a really good deal, it might be 90 cents on the dollar. So our money doesn't go nearly as far as the schools do. So if you ever look at their technology budget, that, that's why. And that just is what it is. And from a procurement standpoint, even before we had that centralized, we looked into can the schools buy stuff that is shared? And that's a real dicey area. You know, the library for students, well, it really has to be in the school building all the time. And when they go to replace equipment, the old stuff bought with a deal cannot be recirculated to another department. It has to be traded in or sold. So, you know, the, the uh, vendors that offer these deals are pretty strict. This is for education, you know, whether it's Apple or whatever it is. So Matt, when you have a level services budget, which is essentially what you're saying, mm -hmm. with a couple of minor exceptions, yep. you know, elections, we, which we, we heard, you know, several times over right. um, about, you know, where that was going. Um, so that's not really the same amount of money. I mean, it's, it, when you right. go level services, is there a factor of two and a half? Is there a factor of three? Is factory because you don't have any I'm assuming you put no numbers here because each one of those divisions actually kind of creates its own budget lines right yeah I mean they, they all they all do and there are some more numbers within the muni sheets but we take things out of that again to get the final budget to put that together but yeah so we look at you know if they if there were cuts it would be easy to say that's not level services you know we're cutting by a few percent Increases are a little tough because we expect things to go up a little bit every year. If something is way off the charts, like, you know, because we have elections, that's way up, I don't consider that level services. But the the year-to-year -year increases that we all sort of count on and the salary increases, you know, we're not asking for any salary increases over and above the 3% the that every other department's asking for. I consider that to be level, level services. So it's, it's a number it is increasing, yeah. but yes, at a, you know, at a, at a, a minimal general number. So yes, yeah, the salaries are accelerating by three. Then three's the then three's the salary, right? Yeah, you know, and that's and that's yeah, that's what I mean. I mean, when you look at the services, it's the same, but you give the cost of living every year yeah. or whatnot. So it it's sort the of the big message here is nothing new. No, no. and uh, I apologize, John. You weren't here last week, so I didn't mention it to you. Um, FinCom has given us a target of 3.15%, so that's kind of an underlying fundamental philosophical target. But the department heads are asking all of us, this is what we want. And there's about $200,000, maybe a little more than that, in requests above the 3.15% FinCom target, just so you hear those numbers. Well, and I'm sorry that I wasn't here last week to know that, but it would be interesting to understand how FinCom got to that decision. I mean, yeah, I can talk to them. Yeah, we can talk, we'll talk separately and not take up everybody's time. Yep. Yeah. And, and just to, to close the circle, and, and we're in agreement, Bob, you're going to be putting some, some numbers together, but part of the, we've got this delta of a few hundred thousand dollars. At some point, I think you, you've asked us to give some guidance on some things, and, and we'll obviously need those numbers to be able to look at them a little bit more closely before we can really offer a whole lot of guidance. Sure. And Bob, I'm sorry. Is is what's being presented tonight a couple hundred thousand dollars above the 3.15 or in addition to what is being presented there are a couple of extras that would be nice that would be um what you're seeing is the over budget. is the over budget so okay if there's anything you're not seeing i'm not aware of it. okay all right thank you <laughs> bob um, so looking back at your summary sheets and the administrative services just so I, we understand this. Um, the second box there has the uh, operating target for FY21. Um, uh, now it's going to. Um, for FY21. 
as being uh, two and a half for administrative services, two and a half million plus a half, about a half a million. Right. Um, that, those are the targets, uh, of a little over three million. Um, <coughs> but in actual fact, what the ask is is for um, three point two million. Is that right? Over yeah, and, and in round numbers, um, it's about a hundred thousand, a little more than that. Over what a, I don't even know how to describe that middle section. Um, that's FinCom guidance for all of us to aggregate. If yep. every department were held to the same increase that FinCom has given out, mm -hmm. then uh, Matt's budget would be a hundred and ten thousand over that guidance. Right. Um, occasionally. Especially when we were doing cuts, it seemed fairer to hold every department to the same target, but I have no aspiration of doing that this year. Um, okay. In past years, some have gotten more, some have gotten less. And all, you know, we talk about it as departments, and it kind of works out in the wash. Um, you know, the fact that MAP has $60,000 or more or less in extra election costs isn't MAP's fault. Right. right. So that really, although it's not an accommodated cost, it could be and I'll treat it that way internally. Um, so he doesn't have to come up with $60,000 of a cut somewhere else in order to afford those elections. Mm -hmm. We'll spread that cost out if you will. I hope that answers your question. And so, yes, yeah, <coughs> yes, thank you. And so when we, to, in order to prepare some feedback for you on how to um, get box two and box three to come together at the top of this page, <coughs> Where would we look um, for specific items uh, to, 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 to? I guess tomorrow night, the two, first of all, I give, to give you a time frame. Mm -hmm. Tomorrow is December 11th. I need to give income a balanced budget in February, so we've got plenty of time for this conversation. Yeah. Um, I expect to ask you tomorrow night, is there anything you didn't see in the budgets that you think we should do or have? Mm -hmm. Just because you haven't seen it doesn't mean I, I shouldn't consider it, we shouldn't consider it. And then um, typically we look at new things that are added as to are they worth adding. Now it's a little tricky because we can't really vote elections down. So there'll be some things, there's a few new FTEs suggested and we'll probably uh, come up with a list. Yeah. Um, but largely, I wasn't necessarily going to be fine to calling it tomorrow night. Mm -hmm. I was going to more be policy level of the things you missed, of the things you're concerned about, of yeah. the services that are not producing you know, a desired result. Um, and then over the course of uh, January, at least at one of your meetings, I expect to have a short discussion at least on, uh, you know, here's some of my thoughts, what do you think? And again, not to short circuit, um, an important part of that is a capital discussion this year. That's not in the department budgets you're seeing, but that's an important aspect. Okay, thanks. Thank you. Relieved. Okay, and thank no you. more questions? Great. Okay, thank you very much. Thank thanks, you. Matt. Cheerful way to start the budget. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, yes. Feels like the Patriots uh, <laughs> initial presentation. <Yeah. laughs> uh, thank you for having me today. I'm the fire chief. I wanted to start um, school over a little bit on the FY20 budget. Uh, we've had some uh, injuries, and unfortunately, they've all occurred at the same time. So we currently have six people that are out injured and several are going to require surgery. That's 2021. Um, yeah, there's a typo in the uh, <laughs> surgery uh, from the board. Um, and we also had two vacancies this, this fiscal year. We have um, identified the people to replace them. We've, we've hired two. Uh, we've brought one on because that person had um, some level of firefighter training and they're currently filling shifts for us. 
the other person uh, didn't have any fire training, and um, uh, she will be going to the academy in June. So we're going to wait uh, to bring that person on to about two to three weeks before the academy starts, and then um, we'll, we'll give that person some basic level of training and we'll help them uh, in the academy. We like to give them a little boost before they go because it's a pretty intensive training program. And what's found by bringing them on just a, a couple of weeks early, um, we can give them uh, training and, and get them uh, at a higher level when they start. So right now with these injuries all at the, all at the same time, uh, I am pro projecting a deficit uh, for, this, for this fiscal year. I just wanted the board to be aware of it now rather than uh, midway through the... Uh, Great, yeah. Which is hours year to date, that's the impact already? Correct, yes. Yes. Wow. One of the trends that we've seen when a, when a person gets injured is a physician is, is requiring uh, physical therapy for several weeks to see if that works. And unfortunately, it hasn't worked and then they've had to move to the surgery. So it, it makes it, I mean, everybody wants to avoid the surgery, but it's unfortunate when you kind of, you kind of see that this is going to go to surgery, that they have to go through the, the, um, the, the process. And, you know, it's their, they have to follow the medical advice of their physician. Any questions on that? Um, Yes. Yeah, I mean, I, <coughs> I think I understand the reason for this, but but I want to make sure that, that we all do. You're you're saying that if someone goes into surgery uh, now or in the next couple of months, say December 2019, January 2020, or something like that, it will take them a year or so to return to duty. No, usually uh, the longest surgeries that we see is for a shoulder mm -hmm. uh, surgery. That's generally six months before they're 100% ready to come back to work. Um, they do come back to work on light duty. Mm -hmm. uh, we have people that are working light duty, but unfortunately they can't staff a truck. They don't have the strength. Yeah. When they have the operation on the shoulder, they lose so much strength mm -hmm. that they just physically can't, can't do the job. Uh, we had a firefighter that had a knee surgery um, and, and they're generally back within eight weeks. So it, it depends on what it is. Because it says estimate mm -hmm. to return to full duty February 1st, 2021, March 1st, 2021. That's a lot longer than six months from now. Yeah, is that a typo? It was 2020? And, and then there's 2011. Oh, yeah. Well, that's, a, yeah, yeah. that's a typo. And these are my, my guesses uh, because one of the longest shoulder surgery um, has the longest shoulder injury, had surgery, and um, I'm, I'm projecting for him April 1st because he's just... I talked to him briefly. Of next year, the following. Yeah. Year. Those are all 2020. Those are all next spring. Yeah. So, so it's, all, it's, it's all 2020. Oh, it's 2020. Yes. I completely messed up. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, fine. That's okay. That's okay. Not it's all 2020. Okay. Yeah. So I'm all. I'm projecting them all to to come in the spring. Come back in the spring. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sorry for that. I was yeah. rushing through. Yeah, that's, that's a relief. That's really that's good. Good news. It's a relief to me too. It's <laughs> <laughs> an awful thing. The, um, and unfortunately with the fire uh, academy, it's, it's a nine month backlog. So when I get a name, it, we have to wait nine months for that academy to start. Thanks for bringing up the, the dates. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's crazy. So I just want to start with just a, a brief overview of the department. So we have four major functions, and that's fire prevention, fire suppression, the emergency medical system, and also emergency management. Uh, this, uh, for the next fiscal year, we're not requesting any new positions, the same staffing, so no, there's no uh, projected changes. We have 53 full-time uh, personnel. And we share um, one uh, administrative uh, person, half-time position with the police department. This is our uh, organizational chart. 
Um, the 33 uh, people, of these, 48 people are assigned to one of our four groups. Each, each group has two officers and 10 firefighters. And their primary focus is on the delivery of emergency services, routine fire inspections. Uh, the administrative functions of the department are performed by the, the chief, assistant chief, and, and the uh, department secretary. Uh, we also have uh, two people that work part-time maintaining the municipal fire alarm system. We call it a half-time position, but those two don't even probably equal a, a half-time position. Uh, each day, the on-duty shift staffs two engine companies and a ladder company and the ambulance. Um, and to ensure that each, each piece of apparatus has a proper staffing, because we need that staffing to, to, to do the mission, we have 10 people on duty. So for this uh, fiscal year, uh, we're requesting five million two hundred ninety-three thousand uh, in for salaries, and that's up two point four percent. For expenses, we're requesting one hundred ninety thousand two hundred seventy dollars, and that's also up two point four percent. So the total budget request is is up two point four percent. Does that follow the hires? Or that follow the salaries? In other words, I get it, they're the same number. They're the same percentage. Of course it is. It's coincidence. It is, yeah. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's just one of those freak things this, this year. Because when I calculate the budget, I, um, I calculate what the non-union personnel, based upon if they're eligible for step increase and what the COLA is going to be. Right. And then the uh, union salary, they have a contract, they have a... They don't you know what they're going to be. It's going to be just, just yeah. calculated out. In each one of these, both new, uh, non-union and union, we have people going through the step system as well. But we also have new people coming in at low, low rates, so it's kind of uh, netted out to a 2.4% increase. Yep. And we increased over time 2% because the salaries are going up 2%. Okay. Is Expenses are um, level funded with the exception of two line items. I requested the ambulance billing be increased $800, and that's to match uh, what we spent for a private vendor to do our ambulance billing. Uh, the ambulance billing is based upon uh, receipts. It's 4% of our receipts. So if the receipts go up like they have gone up, um, if we don't increase that budget, it, it crowds out other needed costs to operate the department. So I requested an increase for that. The other, the other increase I requested was um, uh, $5,720 uh, for fire uniforms or for station clothing. I'm projecting four retirements uh, next year. Is that in 2020 that, or That's 21? FY 2020, and that's why the issue is FY 21. 21 calendar. Yeah. Yeah. I can't guarantee we're going to have four, but I'm looking at, I'm projecting that that's, that's what we're going to have. Greg, just a quick question on that. So when we uh, hire a new firefighter, do they get outfitted fully at that point? They get they a full, full yeah, set of gear? Yeah, certain number of pants, certain number of uh, shirts. It's by the contract, uh, shoes, things like that. Um, in the capital plan in uh, in July, we're replacing turnout gear. So any new people, I'll uh, buy their protective clothing through that. You're replacing everybody's turnout gear? Yes. Is that because of the chemical issues that... Uh, no. Um, or is it just time? We replace it every five years. Turnout gear is good for 10 years. And what that allows us to do is, is have... It, it's, it's kind of beat by five years but their old stuff serves as a backup. Because when they come back from a fire, they have to wash that gear. And if you've got to go back out before you get they a chance. They have to go back out, correct. And it, it has to fit them. So, yeah. so it has to fit them properly. So uh, this keeps the gear in good serviceable condition and allows them for, for a backup set. Yep. And every department is provided, not every, most departments uh, in our area provide two sets to, to firefighters. Some purchase two sets and give them two sets and have them rotated. I think the way we're doing it 
replacing every five years it yep. makes the most sense. And that's worked out very well for yep. us. Uh, just, we have some grants in, in progress. Uh, we received a SAFER grant, and uh, that pays a portion of the cost of the salary and benefits for four firefighters for a three-year period. Uh, the first two years is at 75% of the cost of a firefighter. That includes their health insurance and, and, and everything. So, um, so far, I, I bill for that each every other month. Um, so far, um, we've, we've received $147,000. So great, too. So is this year one of three? Yes, we, we uh, started um, being able to bill for our four new firefighters um, uh, on, on, in February. So I've been, I've been billing um, essentially every, every other month for that. Yeah. So, uh, we're, we're brought in 147,000 since February. Thank you for getting this, by the way. Mm. Oh, thank you. It is, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, it takes several days of, of work to, to do the grant, because you have to compile the statistics, and then you write the grant narratives and, and things. Chief? Uh, yes? Um, who, who provides those grants? Who provides the safer, safer grant? The safer grant is provided by um, FEMA from the Department of Homeland uh, So it's a, fed, a federal yeah, grant. It's a federal grant. And the same, so we received also um, uh, several months ago the Assistance to Firefighters Grant. That's a different FEMA grant, but it's, it's uh, for uh, turnout gear, washer extractors, and dryers. Um, I want to have one at each fire station. Right now we have one uh, small one at the, um, at the Main Street Fire Station. That can only do uh, two sets of gear at once. So to do a shift of uh, 10 take, people take takes forever. Yeah, it takes, okay. and it looks like a laundromat when, when, when uh, after a fire, the stuff is just all over the place. So by um, having a, a larger unit at the downtown station that will take six gets, sets of gear, uh, we can wash the people assigned there very quickly, and then another, uh, Washer extract at the West Side Station that will take three sets and they can wash it right away. And then also a dryer that will speed up that drying process because, it, you know, depending upon the temperature, humidity levels, you know, we have stuff that's scattered around the station for about three days. Yeah. Um, we also received uh, an emergency management uh, planning grant and we're going to use that to offset some of the costs for police and fire training to, to, um, to active uh, incidents. Also, um, we receive each year a, a SAFE grant. That's from the state. Um, we go into the schools and provide a fire safety message to the kids who tar target uh, kindergarten through second grade. Uh, we use a, um, a safe trailer that we house for, for uh, our fire district called Metro Fire, Fire District 13. Uh, we received a $60,000 grant last year for that and bought a new unit. Um, and Metro Fire also kicked in money for that. But uh, that went into service um, this fall. And it's a brand new updated trailer. It's, it's, a, it's a beautiful resource for us. Uh, and we also receive a um, a senior safe grant in the neighborhood of two thousand dollars, and um, one of our captains uh, would go out and give a fire safety message, anti-fall message to, to senior citizens. Also help them with, with some things with their problem with smoke detector, carbon monoxide detector, and help with that. So that's a very good program for us. Uh, this is a, um, a graph of our responses uh, from 2014 uh, through 2019. The 2019 data on your right is only partial data, so we're missing a month. But when I looked at it, um, we're trending uh, to 2017 data, just a, just a little bit below uh, 2018. But uh, it's still, when you look at it over the long term, it's, it's trending upwards. For, for EMS, I, I love to put this slide out. Um, 
every piece of apparatus up there is an ambulance for the town of Reading. We register all our uh, first line fire apparatus as class five ambulances. This permits us to carry a full complement of advanced life support equipment, including medications. Um, this level of service has been provided by anybody in, in this area or to, to this, will be provided on this many trucks that I'm aware of any, anywhere. And it, it's really important. Our ambulance can be anywhere. Today, we heard them go to Wilmington. We heard them go to Wolven. They're at the hospital. So this allows us to, to come in with trained people with medications when our ambulance isn't available. And, you know, in the past, it was just a, it was a basic life support level equipment on there, and we had trained people. So now we provide them with that equipment. We've been doing it, doing it for several years. And, We've had, we found it to be very, very successful. So you do not have to roll the two of them at once anymore? Oh no, we always do for the, for the staffing and the, just, because we have to move patients. We, we have to carry them out of the house, bring them down the stairs. Right. It's, it's labor intensive. And there's a lot of equipment with ALS that needs to come in. There's a regular, regular bag, a medication bag, a heavy defibrillator. You know, a stair chair needs to go in. A lot of equipment needs to go in to get that patient out. And then a lot of information needs to be gathered as the person's... Um, so they always treatment. roll too, even... We will always, yeah. And both of them will be fully equipped. Everything's fully equipped. Yeah. And so the, by putting it on the fire apparatus, it's to provide um, top-level EMS equipment and supplies on scene when our ambulance isn't. So they can start the treatment while we're waiting for a mutual aid um, ambulance to come in from our mutual aid partners, North Reading, uh, right. Wilmington, Wolverine, Medfield. So supplies, equipment, and, and people. And people, yeah, trained people with the tools. Basically, we're giving trained people the tools that they need. Chief, um, to, just so that residents understand why this investment is so important it, it, you sort of have a deep bench so that if your ambulance is away you have trained staff that can start delivering advanced life support um, as soon as they arrive um, th is it is it too much of a overstatement to say that th this this setup has have, has saved lives oh it definitely has yeah without a, without a doubt yeah without a doubt it has it's a it's a great level of service for the for the community. Yeah, yeah, very very proud of the people from for our people for putting this into effect and, and to, to really making it work. You know, it's 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 a real system. Yeah. Thank you. On um, our EMS uh, revenue. Uh, we, we see the trend in the overall uh, trending upwards. And e EMS responses is also trending upwards. Uh, on the far right is uh, 2000 year 2019 partial data. Uh, when, when the full numbers are in at the end of the month, I believe that we're going to be at the same levels as 2017 as, as well. Chief, just a quick question. So um, that's the second number trading more toward 2017. Um, are things, it's a, like a 10% drop, is there? I, I, well, I think what happens is that if you looked at a, a snapshot, when you look at it, when you look at that trend line over a longer period of time, you see it trending up. But when you get there, it's, it's up a little bumpy. Yeah. yeah, it's a little bumpy. And you know, on, on, on our total responses, you can have a major storm where they'll do 60 calls in a 24-hour in a period. That can skew your, your, your calls for one particular year. But when you look at them over, over time, it's, it's trending up. Uh, this is a little bit of data from our EMS system on our, on our types of uh, patients. And you can see that uh, traumatic injury, uh, pain, uh, cardiac issues, uh, general weakness, psychiatric emergencies, and respiratory distress are up in the up in the high areas. And we're seeing a lot of psychological emergencies as well. That seems to be a, a, a trend. Uh, 
this, this slide uh, will show the wide range of medications our firefighters are able to give to our patients. It, it's really a, uh, quite a mix of medications that we're carrying on the, on the trucks. Chief? Yes. Sir. With the, the high number of psychiatric emergencies, I'm just wondering what kind of mental health training is provided um, to to the staff and if, it, if it's adequate or if, if you feel like more investment is needed. I think that's something where you just need to continually train with it. Our, our firefighters have to uh, renew their licenses every two years, so we're in, in, as part of that license renewal, we're doing continual uh, con ed, okay. continuing education. Mm -hmm. So we will bring people to talk about mental health. The last time around, we, we brought a um, person to talk about Alzheimer's mm -hmm. and, and, and what their different, uh, what it's like for them, you know, what they're, how, how they're experiencing, how, you know, how it's impacting their use of their hands, how it impacts their, their eyesight. And, and um, also talked about dementia. So you could kind of understand what that person is dealing with when, when you're arriving. So we do include that as, as part um, of, uh, of our continuum. We had, we, had a, um, we had a cardiologist come in um, this round of training uh, a couple of months ago. And um, we also have our medical director that comes in uh, several times a year that goes over our cases with us. But it's a, it's a pretty robust training program that we have, and, and they hit different categories. But this is something that we do train on. Thank you. But it's never a one and done. Of course. Yeah. Uh, emergency management. So we've had uh, a number of disaster declarations. So well, the primary goal for emergency management is to identify areas of vulnerability to the community, prepare for all disasters, whether natural or man made, and to coordinate the response uh, for an emergency, and also to assist in the recovery phase. And, and another secondary goal is to make sure that we're in compliance with all federal requirements so we're eligible for uh, disaster reimbursements. So this, this slide shows uh, since 2001 the um, reimbursements that we've received from state and federal disaster declarations. And so we're, since 2001, both the Town of Reading and the Reading Municipal Light Department have received a combined total of $1.7 million uh, for, for our cost incurred to respond to these emergencies. And the, the taller one, the, the higher number one you see there, uh, Reading Light was eligible to uh, recover the cost of the damage to their utility. It doesn't happen every every year. It's it's kind of an anomaly when it happens, but it but it does it does happen. You can see here it snowed every weekend. Yeah. Pardon me? Is that the year that it snowed every weekend? Yep, that um, the last one was uh, March uh, 2018, and this is a kind of breakdown of the reimbursement for the March 2018 snowstorm. See, the DPW cost for the snow removal was 136, but the damage to the utilities was 149,000. And then, um, so a, a lot of this, Reading Mike got a little bit more than the town side did, but. Um, our, our usual for a snow can be from ninety to you know one hundred and forty thousand dollars. That, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Is there any state money that we can sometimes apply for too? Or is it really just federal disaster? There's no need to. Uh, we received um, so the 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 uh, program for. Um, for the uh, SAFE program, the student, that, that's a state program. Um, I just applied for a, a small grant from the state that will replace uh, firefighter gloves and hoods, and I'm waiting to hear on that. Um, but most of, it's, most of it's federal, other than those uh, two items. Uh, Bob was successful uh, last year receiving a, a, a 
Would you call it a grant or would you call it a, um, that we use for police and fire training? Uh, maybe an earmark. Yeah. That's a better way to. That, that was a considerable amount of money for police and fire to be trained. One, one last question. Sorry. The, uh, are we getting fewer overdose calls uh, so far this year? I'm just looking at the, the lock zone. Is that the. Yes. Um, I didn't look at that to see the numbers um, just for uh, the administration of, of uh, naloxone, um, but our substance abuse that would include alcohol and stuff is is it a higher number? It's it's uh, higher. It's, it's 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 a high number for our responses. Um, okay. It's uh, the one the, the tenth tenth down from the bottom. I mean tenth from the top. You know. Our tenth highest response. Um, so it is something that that's not an unusual response for us. Um, I didn't look at our um, dosage uh, for naloxone from one year to the next because that can go up a little bit. Sometimes we see about ten patients for for that. Yeah. So you know that, that that can be a little bit bumpy looking at it from year to year. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you don't want me to do it. Good evening. I try to not talk too loud. I know I have a loud voice. Usually, everybody's just talking to a microphone to help amplify that. <laughs> um, thank you for having us here. Um, as we talk about tonight, for the police department budget, we have the three with the police department. We have dispatch and the office that used to be formerly known as Arcasa will be coming on board with us. Um, the police departments we're looking at a budget request for fiscal year 21 for 5,769,650 or 1.9% increase compared to fiscal year 20. This is our organization chart here. Uh, very simple, we have the chief of police, deputy chief, and then from there we have um, four divisions broken up by support, service, support services division commander, a criminal division commander, the night shift and day shift division commanders for patrol. And each one of those has broken up. Dispatch falls under the night shift commander, and we have community services falls under different things from that. I was just going to try to go through most of the slides. If you have any particular questions, please let me know. For staff and for wages, uh, we're looking at a 2.9% uh, increase. We are budgeted for 46 sworn officers. We're currently staffed at 43. Uh, we have two officers that we just hired, a male and female, that will be started in the Academy in January of 2020. The Academy was supposed to start in November of this year, but it got postponed to January 18th, sorry, January 13th. They're expected to graduate in July of 2020, and then they'll start the field training, so we'll actually not see them on the road until the middle of October, roughly after field training. Um, unlike the fire department, it's not a knock on you, police chief, you know that. Um, we cannot actually start the officers early. Uh, they have to be to become a police officer. They have to be certified through the academy. So we actually don't even have an option of starting them early to help out with anything. So, um, like I said, we did hire two of the officers, uh, male and female, will be starting with us in January, and we'll hopefully they'll be coming on the road um, around October of uh, 2020. Three additional officers are not currently active with the force. One is expected to return from deployment overseas in February of 2020. Another expected return in November of 2020, and we have no anticipated date on the third officer. Dave, uh, before you jump, the um, so the when you hire two people like you just did, the, do they stay at their old jobs till they go to the academy? Is that the way that that works? Yes. And then do they go on our payroll once they go to the academy? So the day they start the academy, they'll come on our payroll. Got it. Yes. Okay. So we're paying for them a in through field training for a good nine months before they actually count towards the staff level. Got it. Um, so dispatch is currently at full staffing uh, with two dispatches that are finishing up their training soon and they'll be going to their regular groups. We have three administrative assistants. We have one split between us and the fire departments. And we have a civilian uh, part-time park parking enforcement officer and part-time animal control officer. 
We have 21 um, pretty much school crossing guards, and we have two full-time positions for what was known as our CASA, we're calling the Threat and Coalition. Saturday lines for uh, meet all contractual agreements in uh, direction regarding non-union compensation to date, and this would include um, any steps or call adjustments. Expenses, um, I'm looking at a reduction of about 13.3%. The reason for this primarily is uh, last budget I had asked for the purchase of an additional, an extra cruiser, a third cruiser, to match the increase in staffing. I'm not looking for that going for the future. I'm looking to go back to the uh, standard to a year. So that's a majority of the drop for the expenses. The biggest thing I've been focusing on um, the past year has been community outreach. I'm a firm believer in this day and age that police work with under fire as much as it is that we need to get out there, we need to market ourselves um, basically like a business. And our customer service, what we market is, we service is community service. And we need to market ourselves and get out there and do a lot more community outreach than we've ever done before. So, for those of you who follow us on Facebook and social media, um, we currently have over 5,000 followers on Facebook, and this year we had an Instagram in. And we made a significant effort to increase postings on there, um, community feel good stuff, I'll stop my lemonade stands, um, any programs we're offering, but also getting out there about road closures, accidents during storms or anything we're doing, just to really blast it out to the public so they know what's going on out there, try to avoid the area and keep people informed as much as possible. We've also significantly increased the amount of um, press releases we're putting out because I think it's important for the community to know not only what's going on, but what we do. So that's what we do with that. So we've done a, we've done a huge markup on that this year. We've hosted many programs. Uh, Assistant Police Academy just completed the RAD and Women's Self Defense program. We have um, did two classes this year, and we've been able to offer that for free since 1996. Again, thanks to um, the Women's League of Reading, who has donated the money to keep that program running. We've been able to offer free to the residents. Um, we've participated in the Bicycle Helmet Safety Program. We hand out citations for the kids that are caught wearing their helmets for ice cream and pizza, again, it's us working with the businesses. Um, we've done Coffee to Cop, the 11 Cruiser Torch Run. We just participated in No Shave November. We raised $3,400 for the veterans. We're currently in the middle of Don't Shave December, and we've raised over $2,000 for the Ready Food Pantry. <coughs> so, um, simple lettuce. I believe the No Shave Policy and the office donated money in this, and so we've raised $3,400 and another $2,000 for two charities. We've done a bunch of things. We just had a very first Fox vs. Kids basketball game with the YMCA. We lost. We did try our hardest, but we lost to the YMCA kids, the 9 12 year olds, uh, by four points. Uh, but it was the first time we did this with the YMCA, and the success of this, I guarantee you, this is going to be happening on a regular basis. Um, recently, we just designated the police station lot and lobby as a safe internet exchange zone to people. There's a lot more people that do stuff like the running on yard, let yard sale, pay it forward and stuff like this, and a lot of people want to keep their privacy, make sure the privacy and the safety. So we actually designate the lobby of the police station as a safe place for them to meet up, and where they can come safely, it's monitored 24 seven, where all the staff, there's cameras there, and it's just a safe location. We don't get involved in the exchange at all, but it's a safe location for people to meet up. We thought it was an important service to the town, and the, uh, thanks to the facilities, and quickly, as soon as we got the signs up, Joe had the guys come right up and put the signs up, and really get the press release out, press release out especially with the holidays coming up, we really wanted to get that out there. That's something we initiated this year. One of my favorite things we did this year, collaboration with the schools, is we sent uniform, uniform officers into all the elementary schools, and we took over the lunchroom, and we served lunch to all the kids kindergarten through fifth grade. We had the hairnets on, we had the rubber gloves on, we had the aprons on. Um, we took over and served lunch. Um, I'll make it clear, the lunch ladies were still in charge. I know I didn't yell that because I was serving too many tater talks per kid, so I had spoken to and that was taken away from me. But um, we were able to do that. I reached out to our Fire Chief uh, Burns and Superintendent John Doherty again, and we're going to do the same thing in the spring, but this time I should get out the fire department to come with us. We've got the police officers and the firefighters in uniform. I'm looking forward to coordinating something like that, and having them serve lunches together. But again, it's what that community outreach and especially interacting with our youth. Any chance I get to interact with our youth in a positive way, we're, we're looking at doing. But that's been our biggest focus is just increasing that, increasing community awareness, and increasing giving back to the community. The patrol division is obviously our most um, visible. They're the face of the police department. They're the ones you see out there every day. They're the ones that are out there taking the calls for service, stopping all the investigations. They're out there in all sorts of weather. Whether it's great weather, 110 out, negative two, middle of the snowstorm, or blizzard, they're out there doing all the work. Uh, they're currently staffed with 11 officers on the day shift, uh, with two sergeants and a lieutenant, eight patrol officers, sorry, over total. 
The night shift is currently staffed with 19 officers and it is by the typo. And uh, the night patrol is sent to five sidings and 13 patrol losses. Uh, we're hoping to get back to full staffing in the next year or so, which we can increase out there. Um, they're responsible for the day to day stuff alarm calls, medicals, car crashes, unwanted guests, welfare persons checks, um, take basic reports, child custody exchange, and uh, any health, health, mental health related calls and missing persons. The vast majority of the incident reports and police reports filed come from the patrol force, the initiated patrol force. Some will be followed up by detectives, but the majority will come through there. And there's a variety of reports that they service. Um, a normal call could end up having a motor vehicle crash as well as an arrest, maybe a 51A file for this, uh, through the Department of Champ Children's Family Services. The depth of police reports, the, what we have to do for information in the now, has significantly increased over the past 20 years, 25 years that I've been here, so an officer's off the street for a lot longer now to document the report, because it's not the report, it didn't happen. It's report writing is emphasized that we send officers to class on report writing skills. We meet with the DA's office to go over like what's in the report was missing and there's a lot more of that in there. So it's taking more and more time for the officers off the road to do these reports. Again, there's been changes in evidence collection and documentation that require a large amount of property or statements or photographs to put in. There's more rigid procedures now, so it takes a lot more time for us to even get basic evidence put into the evidence room. Uh, they're definitely the most visible police departments, and in between cost of service, they are out there to community outreach. They're out there stopping by the lemonade stands, they're giving out the ice cream citations, they're stopping in the businesses, walking around talking, and if we can get full staffing, my goal is to get more um, back out on the street, walking the beat, and um, stopping the crews and get them to walk around in the summertime, get the mountain bikes back out, and really get out there and get in touch with our community. And that's the main focus is that. But they're doing that in between cost of service. Now the biggest, so the stats I go through, I just want to point out one thing. You are going to see a drop off in the amount of traffic stops we made where we issued motor vehicle, motor vehicle citations and warnings. That's a direct result of the fact that there's six fuel bodies on the road right now. You are going to notice the stat on the left though, we're almost over 2,000 more calls for service this year already than we're already of last year. So calls for service have gone up already by almost 2,000 with six less bodies, so we can't focus as much as we wanted to on traffic force in the neighborhoods. We're trying, we're trying to get as much as we can, but constantly hear the officers call out that they're on location, do traffic enforcement, and they're getting pulled away to go for call for service. So that's probably the two big stats you'll notice. Yes, Sam? What do you think is driving that increase in calls for service? Is there is there a trend you're seeing? The increase in residents, um, a lot of it is to do with maybe construction of the plants, um, parking plants in the different areas. Oh. Um, just the traffic going through Reading, there's been an increased call of um, motor vehicle complaints, parking complaints. Okay. Um, suspicious persons actually is down, which is a little interesting. I'll show that another stat. Uh, suspicious motor vehicle calls is down, but the general cost of service are just significantly up there, um, more and more and more. Um, a variety of calls as opposed to one particular area. When we look at the stats, I, I, I really kept up my thumb on the one area. So you're getting a lot of calls about parking? We go to the downtown area, yes, we've yeah. dealt with a lot of that lately, and um, uh, we're trying to deal with that more. Mm -hmm. And uh, but just the variety of calls on in general, uh, fraud particularly, you can see that fraud and ID theft is, is on a steady, scary rise. Mm -hmm. All right, and that takes up a lot of time for us to investigate as well. You know, it's interesting. I I did my um, my monthly senior hours today, and um, that was the topic. Really? I had, you know, I, I probably had 10 people talk to me over an hour and a half, um, and seven or eight of them were just, you know, they were a little freaked out about the amount of calls they're getting. Yep. Yep. There's a lot of pressure that especially goes to our seniors yes. around that. So. And that's one of the things we worked on with our community service officer, also Shaughnessy. She does have lunch with the seniors on a regular basis. Right. Work with DA Mary Ryan's office, the sheriff's office, and you're giving them classes out about not giving information out and, and talking to the seniors, letting them know. But yes, yeah, we are seeing a dramatic. Well, they all on. commented on the fact that they do see your people and they've been good, responded to very well. So it wasn't like a complaining thing, it was yeah. like a more of an alarm thing that they just can't believe. How many people are trying to get in their pocket? Yep. You know, it's stunning. Yeah, we're seeing it. And I think, unfortunately, we're going to see it more and more. As Christmas comes up, the more people buying online, yeah. we're going to see even more of an increase of this month. 
So industry reports is a police report that sort are of filed. Um, we usually see uptake in December with um, package thefts, bad weather coming, and identity theft. So these numbers will rise, and we're predicted to be right around where we've been for the past couple of years with the amount of police reports that we've done. Chief, excuse me, Mr. Rochek, go back just to the last topic. Um, is there a recommendation that you have in case someone feels that there is a scam going on? Is there a, a recommended process that we have in place? Or We always ask them to call us. Yep. We'll come to them, or if they come to the station. We have a conversation with them about what was given out, who they talked to, and if we think private information was given out, then we actually have packets that we handed them about notifying the credit agencies, um, notifying the banks, the credit cards and stuff. If they haven't given anything out, we try to um, assure them that it's okay, they didn't give it out, they did the right thing, and give them the information anyway. But so it depends on the need, the seriousness. We've actually helped state, we've gone off the state, and helped make phone calls to the credit card agencies to help people to get um, sooner. And it's, it's, um, again, it, it's a service we, we feel it's a must provide. We try to do as much as we can to help people, but the recommendation is, please, if you think you're a victim of scam, if you don't know, call us, and then we'll, because sometimes if we find out about a scam going on, we have put on social media, we've talked to the other police agencies, and let people know what's going on out there. It's a great way for us to, again, let the public know. Thank you. You know, some of these stats, um, I can't explain certain trends. Um, it's kind of up and down, but uh, like the stuff I actually said, when you look over a long period of time, most things are generally trending up. Um, arrests are down slightly, criminal client applications down slightly. We had a busy year last year, certain things. But um, you have seen a significant decrease in motor vehicle crashes investigated. Um, I think the traffic enforcement really having to do in higher traveled areas has paid off because we have seen a steady decline in the amount of motor vehicle crashes we've been investigating. And I think a lot of that has to do with direct with enforcement. If it doesn't, I'm still going to take credit for it, but I'm pretty sure that's what it has to do with it. Um, but you can see um, the last slide on the right, fraud has gone up early in December. And we're at 167, we had 141 in total last year. This is generally our busier time with that. So I have a feeling that that's just going to be even higher when I run the end of the year stats. Because these stats are going up against full years right now. Alarm calls have gone down. Um, the only thing I think is people, the, the, the type of alarms, windows and doors are better now. They don't wiggle a lot. They don't set trigger, set off false alarms. We have noticed this steady drop off in um, alarms so through the schools businesses and uh, houses. We have seen a decrease statewide in the amount of overdose and drug related calls. Um, suicide attempts and threats, we are pretty much right around and it, unfortunately it's this time of season that we see it, depression comes up. So I honestly think that these stats have come up a little bit more. Calls involving alcohol for, alcohol for us have gone down, um, not, we're still right on pace. Same thing with drugs, we're right around the lower, and opiates have dropped down too. We'll see the national trend. The stat to the right is what you see is mental health related calls. We're at 357 all of last year. As of Sunday morning, we're at 355. Um, that's going up. And I know Ian, you asked a question of the fire chief about it, so I'm going to preempt that. Perfect. Um, Thank you. Yes, we do an extra training. We're constantly seeking out extra training. Um, we do crisis and dementia training. We've done training specifically on autism on um, dementia, different, we're always constantly seeking out and improving. And we have to get recertified every year as police officers attending any old in-service. That training is provided there as well, but we've also actually sat, uh, sought out and we're actually getting some of our police officers, um, our community service officer, also Sean, so he's gonna be certified as a trainer and work with um, the group fully known as our CASA. Um, yeah. Work with them for um, um, crisis intervention training and stuff. It's something that's on our forefront and we are, Anything we can do to increase that training we've been doing, we've been sending the officers to, and that's been our biggest focus, and it's continued to be our biggest focus. Uh, how about um, resources for your staff and your officers for supporting them in um, the secondary trauma they might experience in responding to these calls? Okay. So, NEMLEC, which is you, you, the most things you think of NEMLEC, you think of the SWAT team. Um, what comes in for their regional response team. There's actually, through them left, there's a crisis intervention team that we have. So when we have a major incident like that, not only do we have the EAP, the Employee Assistance Program through the town, we do have, um, NEMLAC does offer police officers that are trained as psychologists 
will come in and meet with the officers in private, and we've set that up before, and we are looking at how some of our officers train and join that team. That team is growing more and more and more, because um, police suicides nationwide are up significantly, and it's, it's, it's scary how many police officers are actually um, committing suicide now. It's a significantly higher rate than we ever thought, and we're working on our mental health for us as well as the public. So it, it's both on, both on the forefront. Yeah. But we're learning to take care of ourselves too. A, a police officer feels much more comfortable talking about the police officers that live that than they do to a, a council that they don't know really what the background is. And that's what we've been working on. Okay. Thank you. Domestic disturbances um, have leveled out. I cannot explain why we had more last year than we ever did before. But we've kind of, on an average for that, I think it's a good thing that the trend has gone down. Calls for domestic assistance have gone down as well. Local people are seeking out information, dealing with family members, um, looking for restraining orders. That's kind of trended down a bit as well. That's a good thing. But child custody exchanges where a police officer actually watches the couple exchange the children and then they take off and then come back later on has seen a significant increase. And as well as violation of restraining orders is up a lot. But that could be a skewed number because if we have one person that's constantly violating restraining order, even from, we've had from prison where we have one person that's in jail for violating restraining order, they've got their phone rights and they call the person they're not supposed to from jail and we end up charging them while they're in jail. So that number can be a little skewed because that could be one person that committed 10 violations in a year. So that's kind of a, it's a tough number to kind of give you like a, a full, for, full uh, footprint on. So a child custody exchange is not a, a criminal act. That's where it's court ordered that the that op, an officer be present for the for the handoff. Yes, okay. uh, or it doesn't have to be court ordered. If both couples sometimes agree to it, it is because they want to witness. Right. Does come to the lobby, will the police officer go out, stand by while they do the custody exchange, and then when one leaves, we'll wait, and then a few months later, the other person will leave. Okay. Um, usually, it's court ordered, but there is some instances it's not. But again, if the police officer that goes out and stands by, it doesn't generate a report instead of generating, right. but it does take. 15, 20, 25 minutes out of the shift. Yeah. But we have seen a dramatic increase in those numbers. I think there's a lot of lawyers that are recommending it to their clients. And, you know, that's, that's a stunning jump, really. Yeah. That is. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. In I want you to guess, again, that's, those are calls we respond to. It's not anything proactive. Those are down. Threats are a little bit on average. Threats and phone calls have gone down. And suspicious persons, suspicious motor vehicles. I can't tell you why they've gone down, but level of calls we've got for those have uh, decreased. Well, for residents, it's going to continue to be high. Uh, generally, um, somebody, family member wants to check on somebody they haven't talked to in a while. With an aging population in Reading, I don't think that that's going to decrease by any means, but that's a police officer, generally an engine, and a um, ambulance going because we don't know what we have. Is the person that's in a medical, is it simple they weren't there, or is um, the kind of potential crime happen, we don't know. So we actually send three, uh, three things there until we determine what is actually going on, and then from there we make the determination what we kind of can't release. But that's actually tying up a fire truck, and the ambulance and a police car during that. On a, on a welfare check? Yes, depending on what the call, depending on what the call is, because we'd rather, we'd rather go with the fire department. If it is a medical, we'd rather have them right there. But yeah, but generally it's for the most part, unless it's, unless we think it's something domestic related, then we'll send two or three cruises along the fire department stage down the street. Hmm? I was gonna say we never enter a house without you. Yep. yep. Mm. And sometimes we have to force entry because the elderly person could be down down on the floor. Mm -hmm. right. When we do come across them, we'll be down on the floor for, for hours, days, so, so, you know, just go down and go And unfortunately, if we get there and it's too late, the person has expired, it's a sudden death, we then take over as investigation and make sure it's not potentially a crime scene and make sure it was natural causes, and that could tie up people for a detective. It makes sense, but you don't think about it that way, you know, I mean, you don't uh, think about how mobilized you'd have to be yeah. around that kind of request. In missing persons for adults, um, we're average where we were last year, we're around the normal. Um, that can be generally the adults, we're generally dealing with somebody from dementia um, who has or all time is then trail off. That can take a significant amount of resources to find that person, but that's why we've worked hard with the media blitzes, working with the media, getting photographs out, getting information out. And juveniles, same thing, depending on what the, uh, the circumstances are around that. But Last year, I know we had 17, that could have been the same youth that left home five different times. So that, that, again, that could be kind of a skewed number. Yeah. 
Briefly, the uh, detectives division is uh, staffed with eight officers, the lieutenant detective, five detectives, and two school resource officers now. We do have the two SROs, fully dedicated to schools, one is stationed out of high school, and the other one stationed out of Parker. And then from there, one's primarily off school that stays at the high school and also the Batcher splits up the elementary schools, but they're a great tandem effort and they work very hard together. Um, and we have the two civilians compromised in the Red Coalition, formerly our CASA, do form the detective division. That's not different, that's always what happened because of our investigation because of school resource officers that work with the schools and the coalition work with the schools. This made more sense to house them under there. Um, detectives division reviews all reports, conducts investigations on numerous types of crimes. Um, they fall up on fraud cases, cyber crimes, um, deaths, overdoses, child enticements, and we have one detective assigned to the prosecutor's role that handles all court materials, including um, processing of motor vehicle citations, that kind of stuff. And they do a variety of tasks. We have two detectives that do the evidence control officers. They're responsible for the evidence room. The evidence room is locked down hard. There's very limited access to the evidence regular audits that are performed on the um, evidence room. Part of that is accreditation. Um, we're, we're re accredited again, and part of that was going through a full process the evidence room, but we actually severely limit. I don't have access to the evidence room. There's no need for me to have access to it, so I don't have access to it. It's limited to a certain amount of people, but audits are done by independent people to come in and review it to make sure we're in compliance. We're very strict on those kind of procedures. They do, um, we do participate in community-based justice programs, working with the DA's office and schools, the diversion programs. And our SROs are part of the Regional School Threat Assessment Response Team, that's known as STARS. They're not the only member of the NEMLAC we have. That is falls in the NEMLAC. We do have one officer that's assigned to the SWAT team, one assigned to the Regional Response Team, and one of our dispatches is actually um, assigned to the Incident Management Team. So we have a large representative on NEMLAC, um, which is great because my training and resources they bring back to the town is um, significant. And the detectives do work with the Threatening Coalition to collect any of the drugs for the IRX Roundup program. Those are the shops boxes, the med boxes that are located in the police station 24 7, where we encourage people to come in and get rid of medications. If you don't need it, bring it in, let's get rid of it, let's get it off the street. The biggest thing I wanted to focus on was this next one um, public records requests. We had 420 requests in 17 for an after 30 a month. We had 464 requests in 2018, which is 39 a month. As of November right now, we've received over 1,061 public records requests for an average of about 96 a month. Um, I think it's 96 point blah, 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 this is the even number, I hate the decimal points. Um, <clears throat> public records just have gone up significantly, more and more people um, are seeing it from law, law firms. A law firm will come in and ask for the last 30 days of ask reports, and they follow up on there and try to contact people and look at for, um, I guess, to see if they want to sue, if they'll limit for it. That's the biggest increase we've seen. Uh, it's also been from law firms. And Chase, they, chasing they, the end. Chasing the end. Looking for law reports. Accident reports, and they've been filed a request. And it's, now, a report could be a simple thing as a one page document, or if it's a bigger incident, they could be looking at um, multiple reports phone recordings, radio transmissions, 911 calls, stuff like that. So it can take a little bit of time or a lot of time, and the information has to get reviewed. Our civilian staff actually takes the request. They go through, they process the request, they redact any information that can't be out, social security numbers, dates of birth. We also look at certain things protected on juveniles, different things protected on domestic violence cases, and then it gets handed to the lieutenant detective. He has to review, the lieutenant detective has to review every single one of these and sign off on it. It's like a fail safe to make sure that everything was redacted. He goes through, double checks it, and then if we're denying something for some reason under one of the exemptions, we then have to type up what the exemption is, why we're denying it, and send it off to them. So you have non-sworn people doing everything up to before it leaves the door? Yes. Then you have a detective that has to go through every one of these things? Correct. So my lieutenant detective on top of reading all every single police report that goes through, it is also going through a thousand um, public records requests every day. Just make sure. Yes, he he sits there and basically every day, every every day. Yes, no days off. No, that's a stunning number. And these charitable events. So it, it's stunning. the new law changed is um, they. I'm, it, I'm I'm not a public records officer, so I might say it wrong, but it's the. Limit what you can and can't charge. It's, the amount that you can charge is so small, in school, it's not even worth trying to pile how much it costs. If it's a large, major thing where we're pulling 
multiple ways reports, phone recorders, we're about to touch time into it that we can look at it, but we have to let them know in advance how much time, how much money we think it's going to cost, how much time it does, and then they have to have the right to know that in advance, but then they request a waiver most times to get it waived. Um, we've had sometimes um, these groups out there, watch groups that go out there, they're doing a public service, they're just making sure we're following the law. And they'll apply for a bunch of reports, make sure we're following the law, and they request the exemption because they're doing it as a status thing or a search thing, and a lot of times we have to make the exemption and not charge them. Yeah, that's a full-time job. It, it is, and that's, that's... That's a person. It is, and that's what our clerical staff is currently dealing with, is um, the yeah. bulk of us is, is dealing with this. And there is no, is there? A, there's no additional staff to handle this. That ever, it's being absorbed by existing staff. The help was with the override. We got that half person between us and the fire department. Mm -hmm. That that person is now. I can tell you that person has been a huge um, saver for us. They're primarily helping out with license to carries um, and paperwork and stuff like that. I'll show you some of those numbers in a minute. Mm -hmm. That's kind of what they're primarily going after. But. Um, now their biggest focus has been on of the um, license to uh, the public records quest, but my other admin person, there's been so many that now I have two people kind of doing the job, but my poor detective still gets the Year still over year, though, they've tripled. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right, yeah, right. That's scary. That's, which tells you, it's, it's, that's a trend. Yes. Yep. That's going to get worse. I think it's going it's to continue up. I see no reason why it's going to go down. I really don't. Is this controlled at the state level? Are they the ones that say, here's what you can charge for and here's what you can't? Or? Yes, it's all regulated through what you kind of can't yes. do. Yep. Guess who makes those laws? <laughs> Lawyers. <laughs> Just say it. You can say it again. <laughs> and we also have to do this with a mid to 10 day period. If it's going to be outside the 10 day period, we have to um, ask for an exemption through the person explaining why we're looking for the exemption. And then we also have to go for the state why we're looking for the exemption as well. Business again. So the Texas Division, um, the amount of investigations have opened up, um, again, these were as of last week, I know for maybe a couple of instances over the weekend that these numbers have gone up since, but we're on a trend to be right around 150 again the amount of investigations for the detectives. Support services, the staff um, with four police officers, the support services lieutenant, traffic and safety officer, armor fleet maintenance officer, and my community service officer as well as three civilians, uh, one who functions as the police fire administrative assistant that we talked about, this is where that person falls under. We have a domestic violence officer through Respond that's grant funded by their house out of the police station and they work with my community service officer and follow up on all domestic cases. And the um, part-time you know, patrol officer, park force would also fall under this. My support services lieutenant oversees this division and is responsible for all the power training and is my accreditation officer. Uh, Lieutenant Christine Amendola works her butt off getting us reaccredited, make sure within procedures, make sure we're following procedures. Believe it or not, reaccreditation is harder than accreditation, because accreditation is when you say, this is what we're gonna do. Accreditation is where you put your money where your mouth is, and we actually follow up with it and show them we did everything we're gonna do. So we were just reaccredited again this year, back in August. We got approved for it, and we're good for another three years, but it's her job to maintain all training and all forms, um, all policies, procedures, anything like that, make sure we're compliance. Now for um, license carries, my honor and fleet main officer and this part-time, uh, half-time clerk of us in the fire department helps with the license carries. And um, each check- Armor and fleet maintenance officer is the same person? Yes, so it's also created and so he um, deals with the firearms training, training for the people for the range, but also deals with the DPW. Um, Jane Cassell, the people that the DPW are fantastic because they know if we go down two or three cruises, we can't service the town. So they're great about getting the, um, the cars on the service. He has we, patrol responsibilities. Well. Yes, yeah. And he also does help with the patrol force as well. Um, but he, each license to carry for a firearms takes about three hours of work. In 2017, we did 461 licenses. In 2018, we had 363. As of November this year, we've already done 348 applications for license to carry. And between him and that part-time person we met in the fire department, this her primary job has been license carries and public records requests. Good question. Um, back to the armor just for a second. How many department vehicles do you have? Dozen. Um, Mark fleet cars, I think we have, um, I'm going to say we have um, a total of, uh, including on Mark, I think we're at about 13 to 14 pass. Like, I could be wrong, I honestly didn't think of that, but between Mark and Mark. 
they're never in the same place. Right. 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 So we get on average two years, maybe two or three years out of a cruiser. And it's not the driven mileage, it's the idle mileage. If they're parked at an accident scene for two hours, the lights go on, the, the idle miles will be just as hard on the cruiser as the driven mileage. Yeah. And one other question, the um, parking enforcement and animal, that's one person that does both? Yes. So it's a split half and half, but it, his, it, depending on his day goes, depending on what happens. If there's no animal calls, nothing to fall off on, no dog bites, no not anything like that, then he's solely focused on um, doing the park enforcement. But to be honest with you, we've been using him more and more to fill the open crossing guide posts. Because um, I have to. Hey, if they, <laughs> so if um, if the crossing guide calls out and one of their um, backups can't be available, we have to staff that. It's the police department's responsible to do that. So we send him to the first one, and the rest are filled by police officers. So sometimes he is doing crossing guard posts and chasing the fall of animal dog bites and doing park points. So it's kind of a mix of his day can be who knows. That can have the turkey. Uh, yeah, he takes care of Lumpy, make sure Lumpy's is okay. Yeah. <laughs> He's good at the parking violations. So. Oh, yes. He's very good. <laughs> and the support services, um, traffic and safety officers has many responsibilities. Um, he attends a lot of meetings with us, with the DPW, the parking, trash, parking task force. Any major construction buildings, road project buildings, um, street construction, he attends all those meetings for us to make sure that um, we, we know what's going on and we keep any detours that close the roads have to be approved through him. That way we can make sure the information goes out, make sure the detours make sense. Um, so he does a lot of work like that and does all of our speed trailers, speed counts, deploying stuff out, assigning the traffic force, but he takes all um, concerns from citizens regarding speeding and assigns them all to the patrol force from there. Our, um, Community service officer, also Shauna, she's extremely busy. It's a full-time position for her. She follows up with domestic violence incidents, elder services, mental health calls. She's our lead on the um, mental health training now. And she runs a tremendous amount of programs and does a tremendous amount of tours as well. And one of the biggest things she works on is the fundraisers. Our biggest fundraiser every year we get asked for is people want to um, donate to get a ride in a police car to school. And that's been one of our most successful fundraisers when um, people come out, town groups to reach out to us. Uh, and it's one of the hottest items to go was to raise money and the kid gets a free guy ride with the, in the police car, lights the sirens to school and has lunch with the police officers. And that's been the biggest fundraiser. Do you charge extras just to let them sit in the front seat? <laughs> no, we do not. But we tell them we've got another seat in the back seat. Well, I was in school. I just tried to stay out of it. <laughs> yes. But uh, she, does, she runs everything. So the RAP program, this is the Police Academy, Clock with the Cop, she runs all that. I let her go with it. She knows what she can and can't do, and she's rock solid for us. Perfect for that role. And also, Shaughnessy, she's, like I said, great top knowledge with that. And also, Scout and our safety officer is phenomenal with that. They really work very hard. Just some numbers on um, park enforcement. Again, we haven't started selling the, um, the access tickets yet for. Um, the month for next year, but this is December is usually our biggest year for it, so these numbers are a little bit off because we're November numbers, but some of these numbers will go up with collections of money and tickets that are out there. Do you have an estimate of when you think the new stickers are going to come in? Um, I'm not going to say this publicly, <laughs> but um, we're going to pick them up Thursday. I said the end of the month um, in case they did weren't ready in time, but um, Thursday morning we're actually going to pick them up, so we can start getting them up Thursday afternoon. As soon as I know for a fact we have them in, then we'll put it out on social media and I'll contact Jane um, Wallman over there and we'll put it all over social media, we'll put it out to the town, put it on the website, and everything else, people know we have it. I was conservative when I, I wanted to put out because I hate saying I'll be ready here and then something happens and they're not ready. So I'd rather say it was later out and get them in earlier. But Thursday right now, not gonna wood. Uh, it's not, yeah. There's nothing in hand, but not gonna wood. Yeah. So that number's gonna probably jump. Gonna shoot right up. Yes, yeah. 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 Lost a month. Yes. <laughs> so any questions about the police department before I jump on the dispatch? No? Okay. So dispatch for the fiscal year 21 budget um, is funded at um, 665500 It's a 6.2% increase um, for fiscal year 20, 95% is on spent personnel. 
We um, dispatches going to be redone this year um, as part of that, um, the increase in the safety that we had go on, and we're looking at um, re looking at evaluating the staffing and dispatch to see if we need to add more during busy times like day shifts and evening shifts. So something we are looking into the possibility of even adding more staffing and dispatch. But we're currently staffed at 11 full-time people, and wages, like I say, is up 6.4%. It's currently staffed intensively in dispatches and one so we a head dispatch who does fill in shifts on a regular basis. The town does get a $50,000 grant, the number one grant, but that's no guarantee. That can go disappear at any time, but you not going wood, we've been getting it every year to offset that. Um, salary lines also meet all contractual agreements, and um, we got a new non-union union compensation. And each year this job, and I'll argue with any department head in here, this is the hardest job in town. Dispatch by far the last job in town. We have a large turnover there because not everybody can do that job, and you get burnt out quickly doing it. And it's a tough job. It's a stressful job. They, the patrol force might be the face of the police department, they're the voice of the police department. But they only they just don't do police. They also do fire. So they dispatch with the fire apparatus. They're on nine one one. They're doing the emergency medical dispatch, and that job has gotten more and more complex. And their role has become crucial in court. What they take on a phone call and relate to us for information can make or break an arrest case for us. So we're actually sending them to more and more training about getting proper information in the district attorney's office, but training like this on, and we're constantly um, look, getting them more training. And this year alone, we're working with the uh, fire chief, the assistant fire chief, we've actually expanded the training with the fire departments, and part of the training with us now is they're actually going over to the fire department, and we're gonna look at doing an annual thing where they're going over there working with the fire department hand in hand, and just kind of keeping them fresh and up to date with the fire department. But that's by far, and I argue with anybody in this room, that is the toughest job in town. What's the, um, the bump in wages? Is that is that more training? Is it, it's the same number of people, right? You want me to answer? Yes, so we'll <laughs> there you go. Collective <laughs> bargaining in progress. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so expenses are up 2.4%. Um, We've been through a lot of training over in there. I think we're finally at a good place in there for staffing. We do have some people that are making it a career decision and are staying. Um, it used to be a stepping stone to become a police officer, a firefighter. We are seeing less and less of that now, more people are taking on as a profession. And um, that's what we're hoping to stay to. But the biggest thing was that uniforms for them, equipment and training. But their log entries, you can see, have gone up. That's the amount of uh, log entries they're putting in. Um, anything to do with um, both agencies. You know, they just don't do the police department, they do the fire department as well. So they cover both agencies. So the log entries have gone up. And they were doing um, the access stickers, um, handing out the access stickers and the compost stickers to the public as well during the regular shift, taking the false so they, if they go off to a academy-like um, environment for training, or how do they do that? So there's a, there's a dispatch academy that we send them to. Uh, they have mandated 911 training, mandated emergency medical dispatch training, um, CPR training, um, chief fight, can you think of anything else that's mandated? But I do know it's like a three or four week long dispatch academy we send them to, and then we constantly send them to um, and it's training, but we've actually heavily had them involved in the joint training we do with the um, fire department for the first one after shooter. They're crucial. They have, they have, you have no idea how important they are. And um, for those of you who have been to the active shooter training, you can see how crucial they are. Because it's, um, they, the wrong information gets out, we can't react without the well, information. You could lose somebody. Because remember there was a time out. Yes. So, but they, they, there is a lot of training out there. The training is getting more and more involved and more and more intense. And, um, and it's becoming a lot more standardized. So that job is, is changing just like we are. And dealing with the mental health related calls, they're fucking mental health too. So we're working at the same okay, training we take on mental health related calls, but it's not too as well. So we move on to the group holding known as our CASA. Does anybody have any questions about dispatch? Yeah. So the Reading Coalition uh, budget is requested for fiscal year 21 is funded at 155,375. It's a 3.6% increase from fiscal year 20. As all of you know, um, they stopped being grant funded, grant funded last uh, during the middle of this year's budget. Um, so now they were always under the police department as far as how the police department. They kind of work with the detectives. Now it's official. They're um, under us as far as budget wise and everything. Um, wages we're looking for plus 3.8 percent and expenses of 1 percent. Um, the Reading Coalition will continue to pursue grant opportunities to defray town costs. The Reading Coalition uh, stopped being said being grant funded in the fall. Um, the Reading Coalition has nationally recognized initiatives which made long-term uh, impacts of substance abuse minus rates, 
It's been a 12% 12 reduction in underage drinking in Reading during the past decade, a 3% reduction in prescription of marijuana use amongst our high school students in the past eight years. They have done tremendous work, and we really look forward to glad the town funded this because I think this is vital for our town. And so I'm not going to do that. Um, so some highlights to them. Prescription bottles, they cost us 47250 to destroy to that hour's roundup. 102 families match with mental health services through interface referral services. Um, that's something we work with, and that's actually another resource for us that we've used to deal with mental health issues for the police officers, uh, not the police officers, but the public we deal with, we sometimes refer to the coalition to help us with interface. Um, 600 students reached through screens, brief intervention referrals, five or six of our students and parents reached out through vaping and opioid prevention workshops. Um, they do training for the police dispatchers, new officers, and the system police academy. They're actually one of the nights is dedicated to the system police academy as them teaching, but a new police officer to come on, part of the field training is actually sit down with our caster and uh, learn, sorry, the coalition and, um, uh, and, and do some training with them. They also deal with um, the public schools as well as lots of prep. Uh, they do case management and juvenile diversion programs with the police prosecutor. They do um, chemical health education. They respond to 24 requests for information or assistance from the public. They conducted um, open house, the Red Lions, the Red Club Field Day, James and Jakes. They participate in a lot of community events. You'll see her out everywhere. Erica is out there. She's been fantastic to deal with. She's everywhere. And um, Sammy Salkin, who was, was our respondent domestic violence advocate, now works for Arcasa, has been a great asset for her as well. In conclusion, um, again, our biggest thing is providing the highest level of service to the community. And our focus is on just um, getting ourselves out there, marketing our product, our marketing uh, public service, and providing the highest quality service to the residents of the town. Without further questions, great, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Dave. Just the facts. Yeah, exactly. I have no idea, shut this off. Yeah, I don't need okay. that, that concludes our entertainment. <laughs> 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 Board members between uh, now and then tomorrow afternoon have any thoughts of tomorrow night, please share them. Otherwise, I've discussed a little bit tonight what I intend to bring. We still have Jane Kinsella to discuss the public works budget, which is complex because it also involves the enterprise funds. So that will take a chunk of time. Um, and again, whatever summary level presentation and discussion we have can take a long time. You know, we have a good month, easy, easily, uh, six weeks maybe, to work with whatever uh, you know, conclusions you've reached tonight. You know, you've gotten a lot thrown at you in a two-week period. Um, take your time digesting and really think through. Um, this, this budget is much easier than the past years in many ways. Um, we are not cutting things, thank, thankfully. And it's, it's a big thanks to the taxpayers for that. Um, but the community is growing and changing, and are we addressing all the needs? Um, we try to be proactive. Governments aren't normally known for that. Um, so if you can help us see things that we're not seeing, um, you know, that, would, that would be especially appreciated. Um, otherwise, that's all we have for this evening. Are we doing the liquor license tomorrow? Yes, um, at 7 o'clock tomorrow. And, and actually, Vanessa asked me to say some more to soon say tonight. Um, the ABCC and Town Council has affirmed that the town does not have any grounds to deny liquor licenses. So if, if you will, respectfully, you should approve all the restaurant liquor licenses tomorrow at 7 o'clock at the continued hearing in this room. Um, on the event we talked about for overcrowding, police and fire were in my office today uh, speaking to the Town Council on a conference call. There will be more information forthcoming on how to handle the exact situation that we found. It's a three-pronged approach. There's building commissioner, there's fire department, and there's you as liquor license holders. So there's three tools in the toolbox. Um, speaking those, of are, those are completely different. And, and they are. Uh, and I, I asked Ibria today, should we try to coordinate these? And she said, well, you, you want to be cohesive, but you don't. One step does not rely on the other. Yeah. Um, and especially the liquor license is more independent from the other two, if you will. So she is prepared to come visit the board in, uh, you know, I'll just say in early 2020, January or February. And at that point, she can present options to you. Uh, but just to be clear, it does not, the, the packet they presented is, is, is appropriate, and everyone presented is appropriate for all the licenses to be approved tomorrow night. So it should be relatively short. Thank you. And we just have the two categories left, correct? 
restaurants. Uh, restaurants and I thought you just had restaurants. Do you remember? Kate? It was all alcohol restaurant and beer and wine restaurant. Oh, oh beer and wine. Okay. So, Andy. Bob, going back to the um, parking permit discussion we had um, last Tuesday. Oh, yeah. 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 Last week. I, I, for some reason, I, I was under the impression that we would have another bite at that apple. But, but, um, is that, is there a way to... The, the chair to today in the email that copied in asked me to include that in the January 21st discussion. Mm -hmm. um, the town staff's coming in to have a more extensive, quite long discussion on downtown parking. Yeah. So that, that's fine. But that wouldn't change. This was, we what we were trying to vote on was a change for um, permits for 2020, correct? Um, in theory, that change could be implemented at any time. But right now, the window is open, if you will, should someone come in and ask. We can't say no until right. the board does something, if the board wants to. Right. And I do understand it's a complex issue. Yeah. and. Uh, because I, I got quite a bit of feedback on that and, and some added insight. And I don't want to, it's harder to take something away right. uh, once, you, once you allow it for a couple months. So, um, um, but I guess uh, we're, we're, we're done tomorrow night for the rest of the year. Correct. Um, and you know, hopefully not a lot of people are watching going to pay attention to this comment. Mm -hmm. um, but in theory, if all the downtown residents asked for this, mm -hmm. you'd have no parking left for businesses and employees. Yeah. That's the dilemma. Okay. So yeah. it, it, it deserves a more complete discussion about what is the objective for this to begin with. I mm -hmm. understand that. I think it does. We were trying to close yeah. the loophole quickly, but I respect the fact that you want a more thorough discussion. And we'll do that in January. Mr. Yeah. Are, are you requesting if there's a way to reconsider the vote? Yes. Is there a way to reconsider the vote? Before you, you, you could um, probably best we put that on agenda, and tomorrow it's too late. So I'll check with town council tomorrow morning and see if that's okay to move to reconsider. Um, I do know that you don't have to be under a public hearing format, I believe. Mm -hmm. um, it, although it was done under a public hearing, the actual requirement not, no, it wasn't done, actually. No, it, it was. was. Public hearing. It was done under public hearing? Yes, it was. Oh, it was. Yes, it was. I don't think it's required to be. I, I remember the liquor was, there was one piece that under liquor that's required, but we did the whole thing. Let me get more information from town council. So, so folks know, um, I did vote in favor last week of that proposal, seeing the, um, that there is, you know, a real risk for you know kind of a run on on applications and and we already have such scarcity of parking um, now as it is however the proposal itself I wasn't fully comfortable with insofar as it doesn't treat um, all residents the same uh, regardless of what kind of residence uh, they inhabit so I would like to see and if we could have an alternative proposal, I would be more comfortable with something that would treat all residents um, equitably in this manner. So, uh, but would still seem to. Um, you got to remember, equitable. I was able to watch that. Mm -hmm. Equitable and equal are not. You know, those are two different terms. They are. They are. Um, and I think that it's important to be equitable. Mm -hmm. I don't think it's a requirement to be equal. Um, it's got, you have to do what makes sense in the situation, in my opinion. So, we'll, and obviously, I wasn't here to vote because right, I wasn't right, here. Right. Otherwise, we yeah, wouldn't be I'll, having this I'll discussion. I'll what legal options you have tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, just present tomorrow. Because it, it could, I guess my question is, if if two of us um, request it this evening, uh, uh, could it fall under under the uh, within forty eight hours? That, that really is a town council question. I, I don't have a problem not doing it unless it somehow violates open use. Okay, so I will and be wearing that advice. So it takes two to request to get it on the uh, agenda? But it's too late because tomorrow night is not 48 hours in advance. That's the issue. Right, but if town council could...
determine whether or not that falls within the 48 hour un uh, unanticipated rule. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I, I'd like to request okay. it if someone else yes. would too, then. I, I'd be interested in also some clarity about our ability, and you may already know the answer to this. There's there's a proposal before us. Do we have would we have the opportunity to amend the proposal? Should, should we be you know should we be able to take it up tomorrow night? Right. Would we have the ability sure. to vote on yeah. it? I, I don't know amend? what you would consider, and I don't yeah. know how to prepare you for that. But and yeah, sure. I'm just you know yeah. I don't have a specific proposal yeah, okay. in mind right now. I've been thinking about different alternatives. I don't have a recommendation at this okay. time, but if we're going to vote on, if we were to vote on it tomorrow, I yeah. want to think. We have that downtown parking meeting tomorrow at 8 or 9 o'clock, so we'll also try to kick some ideas around and see what happens. Because the chair's not here is the reason I brought up if someone else wanted to pre request that to be on the agenda tomorrow night. That would, if we were allowed, that would get it on the agenda for tomorrow night. I would support because if two, if two being back up if it's possible to do that. Okay. I voted for it, but, but you voted against it, so. Yeah. And I voted it's for the, it, but it's sort of misgivings. Yeah, it's, so. I, I just like you to read the vote. And what the hell will I just say? <laughs> we won't know unless we open it up tomorrow night. We'll return tomorrow <laughs> as the world turns. <laughs> Yeah, it takes, without the chair, it takes two two people to request it to get it on the agenda, assuming we can get it on the agenda. Well, you got two people, so. Yes. Yeah, I'll let you know. <coughs> and if I have an answer sooner in the day, I'll let you all know. I just don't know how fast that answer will come. Okay. Any other business? Go ahead, motion. Move to adjourn. Second. second. Is there a second? Second. Yes. Second. All in favor? We're out of here. <laughs>